Ferguson just to introduce myself. And my subject is English literature. Just a very short word about myself. I um, did an English literature degree many years ago. And when I'd done that, the only way I could think of doing English all day, every day, was to become an English teacher. So that's what I did, and that's what I've done all my life, really. And my most recent job was working at Chelmsford College, where I was the leader for the A-level English there. And now I'm doing bits of teaching and trying to do some writing as well. Um, two courses to suggest to you. Um, the first is a course on poetry, and I've deliberately chosen that because I think poetry is often sort of the Cinderella of the genres, in that people have a kind of love-hate relationship with it. I'm not sure whether it's because it's often taught badly, um, but people seem to be a little bit more frightened of poetry than they are of novels or drama. So what I wanted to do was a, um, a series of sessions on different types of poems. And what I suppose kind of inspired me to do this was, A, it enabled me to choose poems that I absolutely love, so that was totally self-indulgent. Um, but also, there's a wonderful quotation by C.S. Lewis, and he was asked, why do we read? And he replied, we read to know we are not alone. And I think that, I mean, there's obviously lots of other reasons why we read as well, but clearly that's a very good, good thing, isn't it? I think there's nothing more satisfying than when you read something, whether it's a poem or a novel, um, and you look at it and you think, yes, that's what it's like, that's how it is, I, I can see that exactly. Um, right, let's hope this works now. We would look, in terms of the course itself, I think one of the things that we do with poetry very often is just look at what it says. And the course would, of course, do that, but we'd look very much at how it's said. So we'd look at the style of the poet and build on um, analytical skills and so on to understand how the poet is conveying what he's got to say. First session, very important, I think, particularly in literature courses, because much of the session, obviously, will be discussion. The beautiful thing about teaching, adults in particular, but actually any age range for literature, is that they always bring so much to the session. So as a teacher, that's great, because you go away and you've learnt so much as well. Um, so in the first session, my aim would be very much to ice break, because I think if you don't um, create an atmosphere where people feel happy to speak and happy to give out their opinions, then I think the rest of the course is a bit flat and it's difficult. Um, and I think, again, with literature particularly, very often when you're contributing, you're perhaps giving something of yourself away and therefore you have to feel quite sort of at home in the group that you're in. So we would spend quite a lot of time in the first session just thinking about poetry generally, talking about people's experiences of poetry, what they think poetry is, poems that they like and so on. Um, one thing that I like to do, and I'm going to just give you a quick taster here, this is not by no means all I do, but I like to look at definitions of poetry, what poets themselves have said about poetry. <coughs> so, for example, Seamus Heaney, who's a well-known poet, obviously, his idea about poetry, poetry is something essential to you, something to recognise instinctively as a true-sounding aspect of yourself and your own experience. These kind of quotations, very good for starting with, because it leads to discussion. Is that how you see poetry? That is really, we read to know we are not alone, in different words, isn't it? Or, another poem that many of you will have heard of, Wilfred Owen, probably some of you know Wilfred Owen very well, his poetry, writing in a very different time, very different perspective, obviously, writing about First World War experiences. His feeling was that all the poet can do today is to warn. And he saw the poet as having very much a task to warn people, in his case, about the horrors of the trenches in the First World War. Other ideas, I put this in just for fun because what I wanted to show you was, when, we, when I've chosen the poems, it'll be a complete variety. So we'll have kind of classic poems, modern poems, sonnets, free verse, a complete mixture with the hope that by using a variety of poems and poets. It will encourage people to go away and pursue individual poets and poems. Now I put this in, this is Brian Patton, still around, still writing. Um, you can tell probably this was written in the 60s, the Merseyside poets, um, so it wasn't just morals and music that were turned on their head, but 
they had a, the Merseyside poets strongly believed that poetry for too long had been elitist, and they were very, very keen to make sure that it was accessible to everybody. Um, so his view of poetry, when in public, poetry should take off its clothes and wave to the nearest person in sight. It should be seen in the company of thieves and lovers rather than journalists and publishers, which is the sort of thing you'd probably expect them to say, but uh, quite fun, I think. Uh, and then just quickly a couple more. Looking at form, um, as I say, a very important part of the course is to look at how poets say things. I think we concentrate so much on what is being said that we can neglect really understanding how the way in which the poet has written the poem um, really contributes to what he's trying to get across. And I think you miss an awful lot of the beauty of a poem if you don't really understand sort of looking at the form of it. So, as I say, critical evaluative skills will be built into it. And, of course, I would expect that many of the people who come on the course would, would be fairly familiar with that sort of thing. But uh, looking at um, form, a nice quotation by John Stallworthy, poetry is words with a tune. And I like that one because, again, another thing that I would emphasise is that poetry is to be heard. And I think this is where we go wrong in schools. I think, you know, we sit at our desks and they read it and it's all very dull. And, it, you know, poetry was not written to be just read flat on the page. Um, so he's looking at rhythm, he's looking at imagery, alliteration, that kind of thing, emphasising, and this is, we would do this in the course, plenty of reading aloud, listening to poetry. Hasten to say nobody would be asked to read aloud if they didn't want to, but uh, it's important to hear it. And I love Coleridge's, Coleridge's idea that Distinction between prose and poetry. Prose is words in their best order. Poetry, the best words in their best order, uh, which is neat and nice, I think. And again, draws your attention to the, the poetry, of course. You know, a poetry poem is not a novel. It's a very short, concise, well, not always very short, but generally short, concise form of what you're trying to say. And therefore, every word counts in a way that perhaps it doesn't in a novel. And I just, I, that's the end of these now, but I've just got carried away. I like <laughs> Poetry is language pared down to its essentials, it's Ezra Pound. If you've read Ezra Pound, you have to wonder whether he actually applied that to himself, but it's a nice idea. Anyway. Right, um, subjects covered, I... You're going to look at that and you'll probably think, but why hasn't she said this or why hasn't she put that down? And I can tell you, I thought long and hard about what to cover, but I was trying to make it as sort of spanning the human experience as possible, to span the widest sort of thing that could include as many things as possible. So the sort of old chestnuts are there, so I've put birth and death and love. Um, I hasten to say that if we spend a week doing birth, it won't be sort of called midwife stuff. It will be, you know, birth as some, either, you know, birth as a metaphor for new beginnings, that sort of thing. Childhood, I've put in there, again, not just poems about what it's like to be a child, but looking at how we view adolescents and children and that sort of thing. Wonderful poem by Elizabeth Jennings I'm going to put in there, which is why I wanted to include this, where she writes about a father walking along with his grown-up son, oh, teenage son, the son is walking along silent and surly and, he's, and the father is just thinking, where has it gone, this child that I used to walk along, hold his hand and he wouldn't shut up and now you know, we're walking along and he won't talk to me. So that's the sort of thing. Love speaks for itself. Life was to cover all the mu rather mundane things that this poetry... There's a lot of subjects that poetry, you find poems on, which are not necessarily poetical. I'll show you an example in a moment. So I wanted a category that would include things that really do show you um, that anything is possible with poetry. You can write about anything um, and, and uh, convey some ideas about it in poetry. Uh, faith or belief I put in there because I think that's quite a, quite a key thing in people's lives, whether they have a faith um, or not. They still have a reason for why they do things and they have a belief system, so we could look at that. I like that one because I think <coughs> everybody brings something different to that. Um, and again, it would be useful to, to discuss that in the class. Death, again, a bit like birth. I wouldn't intend spending a whole hour driving us all to despair by poems about death. Different kinds of death. Death of ideas, death of ambition, um, as well as sort of literal death. So those would be the subjects. Um, I'm just going to give you two, 
I know it's short for time, but I'm going to give you two sample snippets. And I've put these in because I just wanted to show you the variety of poetry that I would intend to include. So under the life section, for example, this is the first verse of a poem by Billy Collins, who is a modern American writer. And as I say, I've put him in here just to show you really the variety. And this thing that you can write a poem about anything, even if it's only the dog next door that's driving you mad, um, he gets that across. If I was doing this in a group, I won't get you to do it, but if I was doing it in a group, um, what I get you to do is to say, every time I come to the word bark, barking or barked, you all have to say it with me. Um, so I would go, the neighbour's dog will not stop, and then everybody would go barking. And every time I come to bark or barking or barked, everybody would join in. The reason being that if you read the whole poem like that, you're tired of the dog barking too. Um, you can hear the dog barking, it works wonderfully. But if I just read it quickly, the name is it's called, another title, it's a good title, another reason why I don't keep a gun in the house, so you can tell he's an American poet. The neighbour's dog will not stop barking. He is barking the same high rhythmic bark that he barks every time they leave the house. They must switch him on on their way out. And then it carries on. It does have a bit of a deeper meaning. But, so. And then, by contrast, very different, Matthew Arnold, which, and this is Dover Beach, which many of you may well know. I absolutely love this poem. I have, anything I do, I put this poem in because I just think it's wonderful. Um, but very, very different to the one on the left. But this is about faith. This is about receding faith, how he feels about religion sort of moving over, perhaps, in culture in the 19th century. Matthew Arnold lost his own faith. And what I love about this poem is that he, he conveys beautifully his own despair at that. And sometimes I think people would have you believe that in the 19th century, people who kind of lost their faith felt as if they'd been liberated from superstition, and it wasn't obviously like that at all. And Matthew Arnold conveys this tremendous sense of his awareness of loss when that happens. Mm. Um, this is just an extract from it, and he uses this central metaphor, the sea of faith. So faith is like the sea, which has been at high tide and is gradually receding. So he talks about the sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy withdrawing roar retreat, retreating. And those last words, you can hear it retreating. It's also slow and drawn out. But as I say, that's just to show you the variety of poetry. Um, what would... It In terms of what will happen in the sessions, just to give you an idea to, to finish with, um, discussion, absolutely central. The beauty of poetry, everybody has something to say, or hopefully. Um, they certainly will after the first session, anyway. So discussion, very important. Analysis, a very useful skill to develop, critical analysis, which is transfers, obviously, to everything that we look at in print or even that we watch on television and so on. So being able to analyse you know, how a writer's choice of words, how a writer's choice of form manipulates us into the response they want us to have, challenges us, um, and so on. Group and individual reading, so definitely, as I said before, allow you know, hearing poems rather than just seeing them on the page. I couldn't think of a better phrase for this because I know that some of you will think, oh no, text-based activities which is, sounds, I'm not sure how you respond to that, but what I mean by that is um, that we will do things that are, for want of a better term, activities that get people to look at things like form and structure. So just to give you a very quick, small example, if you're trying to get people to think about what difference does it make that this person has written a sonnet and not an article, for example, um, a useful exercise is to write out a poem as prose. Just take all the lines out and everything and give it to people and say, now, if this was a poem, where would you put the line endings? It only works if the poem doesn't rhyme, I hasten to say, because obviously <laughs> if it rhymes, it's fairly self-evident. Um, but that, that's a really challenging activity. And it, it really makes people think about, does it make any difference, really, whether this is prose or poetry? Why have they made this line ten syllables and that line three syllables, for example, um, and so on? So that's what I mean by that. Nothing sort of 
too corny, I hope. And then finally, a uh, private reflection, because I do think the other trouble with English teachers is we talk far too much, and we get so carried away and excited, and sometimes people just want to actually have a few minutes to think about something that they've read and just come to terms with it. So I think it's really important for people to have time to think rather than go straight and, okay, what do you think about that poem? I think people, you know, there will be time for people to reflect on that. So that's my poetry course, okay? Um, I'd like to do, very much like to do, a course on place in the novel, setting in the novel. The reason why I would like to do this is because I think it's very neglected. I put there such a literary framework. When we study a novel, these are the aspects that we look at. We all read novels for the plot. First and foremost, we like the narrative, we like the story, we like to know what happens next. Um, these are other aspects. We often relate well to character. We like to hate characters or love characters or sort of think about what they're doing and so on. So that's not an issue. Um, but one thing that I think is very neglected is we, we tend to perhaps skip descriptions of place and setting. And I know that sometimes I do. Is, you know, when, when you're reading a novel and you're anxious to find out what's next and all of a sudden there's a sort of description of the countryside, there's a huge temptation to skip over it. And what I want to do in this course is kind of have a look at what do you miss if you skip over that. Very quickly, because time is running out, for example, if you take a novel like Wuthering Heights, which I'm sure most of you know, um, setting is everything in Wuthering Heights, but you can get so carried away with Heathcliff and Catherine and the romance that, to some extent, the setting takes a back seat. What I did here, just out of interest, was to look at what publishers made of the setting. Um, so here, for example, you've got the scholastic version, which has put on its front the moors, yes, important, dark skies, which we know is important, it's often raining in Wuthering Heights, it's often dark in Wuthering Heights, um, the rocks, but it's presented like a romance, isn't it? You've got the woman turning away, you've got the man looking longingly after her, and meanwhile the environment is not looking promising, so that's what they've made of the setting there. If you contrast that with the Wordsworth classics, um, there's no people in that at all. It's pouring with rain, which is probably about right for Howarth, really, but anyway... Um, it's pouring with rain, it's a grey sky, isolation, obviously a key theme in this version of it, a little bit of sunshine on the horizon, we hope, so perhaps there's hope. But again, using the setting uh, as a picture on the front to suggest the themes in the book. Interesting one, this one, Penguin Classics, um, a solitary figure, dark figure, the setting, almost immaterial, it's rather vague, a few bits of thorns, He's sitting on a very sort of bare fence and appears to be shaking his fist at the setting. So here we have, unlike that, romance gone wrong in the setting, here we have the individual versus nature versus his place shown there. This one is extraordinary. This is, I don't know what this is meant to be. This is the significance of the house. Wuthering Heights was a farm on the Yorkshire Moors, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but clearly, clearly they feel that the house is everything here. And finally, the Penguin Classics, almost um, impressionistic. No people, you notice, very, again, emphasising how significant they feel the fact that it is on the walls. Now, we haven't got time, unfortunately. I'll put these up and you can have a quick look for yourself. If we had all the time in the world, I would give you a piece of paper and a pencil, and I'd get you to draw... This is Mr Gradgrind from Hard Times. And I'd get you to draw him a brilliant text. I can't draw for toffee, but it's the best thing to draw. Then I'd get you to draw his house. So you have the character and you have his setting. And they complement each other beautifully because Mr Gradgrind, as I'm sure most of you know, is a utilitarian man and has no time for anything other than facts and figures. So he has a square head, he has a square body, he has square legs, and he lives in a square house. And it's, it's just beautifully done. So that, again, would probably be quite a nice icebreaker activity. Finally, um, which novels... Now, again, look at this and you think, why didn't she put this? Why didn't she put that? I'm looking at it already and thinking Thomas Hardy should have been there. Um, but what's my basis? I mean, everybody could suggest novels that could be there. But what I've tried to do, I didn't want people to have to have read all the novels before they came. And, but I would like people to have done. So I tried to choose a huge variety um, and they are a variety, those, but also ones that wouldn't take too long if people wanted to read them. 
Great Expectations has to be there. Great Expectations, Great Expectations is the ultimate novel for setting. Also, of course, so much of that is based in Essex and Kent, so I thought that would be an appropriate one to do. Um, Great Gatsby, American, as you know, 1920s. The Go-Between, just been on television, again, very important setting there. Kite Runner, you may or may not know, set in Afghanistan to start with, moves across to Pakistan and then over to the States, setting key to your understanding of that book. And finally, Spies by Michael Frayn, which you may or may not know, but about two boys um, in the Second World War. So I'm sorry I've rushed the novel one so much, but I do think it would be as interesting as the poetry one. Um, and I hope that you'll be interested in those courses. So thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Judith, and I'm going to talk to you about Essex history. Um, I, I do teach... Um, English and I teach history for the South End Adult Community College so I have experience of teaching this subject but they organize their courses a little differently um, so I'm I'm willing to adapt my courses hoping to fit in with what the the groups will will want and I hope you will find me uh, flexible so that um, my subjects will fit exactly what you're looking for so this is me, I'm from South End down here, um, and I, I put that green thing on there as a, a rough idea of the, the area that I would cover. Um, but having said that, I, I am susceptible to flattery, and if there's somebody outside of this area who is interested in my courses, then I'm, I'm sure we can negotiate something. Okay, so I've, I've put four courses on the program, two of which I will teach as a longer course. When I've taught them in South End, they've been 14-week courses, so I've got 14 weeks worth of, of information and lesson planning, um, which can be condensed and adapted to, to suit whatever people want. And then uh, for short courses, the witches and the gardeners, I feel, are something that can be covered in a more intense session. So I've put those on the program as, as maybe a one-day workshop or a lecture, something like that. So I'm just going to run through the four of them so you can get an idea of what I'm thinking about. So the worthies. The, the worst thing about this course is the title, I think. There's, if you say Essex boys or Essex girls or something, people immediately get an impression that doesn't come across very well. Um, and Essex Worthies, I think, sounds a bit dry, but the course is, is anything but that. And I, I think anybody who hasn't looked into this subject will be astounded at the number of Essex people who have contributed to Essex, to Britain, to the world. So I usually do... Um, more or less a chronological run through Worthies of Essex, but based on themes. So I might start with the Earls of Essex, um, the Earls of Oxford up in uh, Castle Hedingham, Essex women, very good topic to explore, plenty of those. Doctors and scientists. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, used the mouthwash this morning. They might have used the well-known brand of mouthwash, Listerine. But did you know while you were using it that it was actually named for Joseph Lister, an Essex man who invented um, antiseptic and did an awful lot for medicine? Um, William Gilbert was a contemporary of Elizabeth I and... and um, did a lot of research into magnetism. Um, the sky is blue. We know the sky is blue because an Essex man, John Strutt, found out about it for us. And we have the Rayleigh effect, which is the uh, light bouncing off the atoms in the atmosphere, making it appear blue, discovered by Lord Rayleigh, also known as John Strutt. 
and also when you turn on your light bulb it works so well because of the argon in it again discovered by an Essex man plenty of doctors and scientists to keep us busy authors and artists of course I could do a whole course on Essex authors and artists um, William Morris for example who covers both of those categories Essex in wartime, um, war heroes, um, people like Jack Cornwall, who was the, the youngest man to receive a Victoria Cross, 16 years old. Adventurers to America as well, um, the Winthrop family, the Oglethorpes. If you, you just have to look at a map of America and you will see a whole list of Essex place names. There's three places just called Essex, for example, in, in New England. Um, so Essex has very close links with New England and Essex people seem to be popping across there all the time to be elected of governor of this and that other state. Um, so they had a, a lot of influence in what um, America has become today. Essex Giants. So I wanted to highlight some particular personalities who I thought they do fit into one of the other categories, but I thought that's a person that needs looking at in closer detail. Um, so if we take some of the other categories every week, I might look at three or four personalities that, that come under that heading. But with the Essex Giants, then I think one or two of them in a session is enough and the group can really get to know the, the people. So I don't know if you have some ideas amongst you of who you think are, are the Essex Giants, the, the Essex personalities that we should be most proud of. These are a few of my favourites. Margaret Cavendish, I love Margaret Cavendish. First woman elected to the, um, the Science Society. She was a, an authoress. She was a, an astronomer. She was a scientist. Um, she was a, a socialist. She was completely nuts, um, but, <laughs> but a fabulous woman. Nicholas Tyndall, Judge Tyndall. Um, very influential judge. Did a lot for Essex and and the country as a whole, involved in a lot of um, high case um, trials. For example, um, Caroline of Brunswick, when she was down at South End and there was rumours of uh, illicit goings on when she was holidaying in South End, where I'm from, Nicholas Tyndall was there to uh, speak up for her. Lawrence Oates, so Captain Oates, who just went outside. He wasn't born in Essex, but he's, he was brought up in Essex and, and called Essex his home. He's from Guestingthorpe, so very interesting man, him. Thomas Audley, of course, um, very influential with um, Henry VIII. And I found, <coughs> if you start looking at Thomas Audley's family, he's related to so many other people. He's... he's um, influential through his relatives as well. And Frank Crittle, I really love Frank. So Frank grew up having a, a, a scrape of butter on his bread if he was lucky and grew up to be a multimillionaire and, and Crittle windows are still going strong around the world today. Um, and he was, was one of the first people who was a, a true socialist industrialist and, and looked after his workers built Silver End um, and I believe he was the first it was the first company to um, introduce shorter working hours and um, rights for the workers so he's a, a fabulous man to look at. Essex Villains of course uh, Dick Turpin is perhaps our most famous but then we have really interesting people like John Hawkwood who is a hero in Italy despite being responsible for the massacre of a whole village. Um, philanthropists and entrepreneurs, Elizabeth Fry spent a lot of time in, in Essex. 
entertainers and sportsmen. Again, you could have a whole course on entertainers and sportsmen. Um, there will be more. I might mention Graham Gooch. The, the sportsmen are just endless. And then I would usually round off the course with, with modern worthies. And again, there's plenty of those about um, Helen Mirren to mention one. <laughs> OK, so I'll just show you my poster. This I brought with me. This is a poster that my last class completed. So every time we spoke about a worthy in the lesson, oh, thank you very much, they, um, this is the timeline. And so they glued on a picture of the worthy on the timeline. So this is a 14-week course worth of worthies. And I think it's, it shows you just how many worthies there are. These are the, the earls. Here's poor old John Hawkwood in the middle all by himself in the 1300s. And then the Victorian age, hundreds of, of Essex worthies. So um, if you divide that in half, that's how many worthies you'd be able to talk about in seven weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. So the witches. Um, the witches, I think, is something that a lot of people think they know about the Essex witches. And there are a lot of stories and legends and and people make up their own stories about witches and, and the films, of course, are not <coughs> true to type. So in my witches course, whether it's a workshop or a lecture, um, I would hope to get to the truth. We will look at the, the actual records, what the actual court records say from the time about the witches so that you will know, you know who were these women and what was the truth, who was accusing them and why, what had they done, and what happened to them and then you would know the truth once and for all. So the, the two famous <coughs> witch trials are the St. Ozith's witch trials and the Manning Tree witch trials, which was our friend Matthew Hopkins, who would come into the Essex Worthies course as well under villains. I will <laughs> miss Matthew Hopkins. Here's poor old um, Ursula Kemp from the, the 1582 trial. Um, and so they... She um, has been in the public eye until relatively recently because her skeleton was, was found and she was put on display 300 years after she died. Um, the reason we know so much about the witch trials is because of these pamphlets that were written at the time by people who were actually there. So it is possible to get something of the truth. And Matthew Hopkins wrote his own pamphlet. This is the little prison cell in uh, Colchester Castle where they kept the witches. Maybe um, maybe a dozen of them all squeezed in there or more. Okay. Oh, this is uh, this is our own a cunning man, cunning moral from Hadley, down in South Essex, who came to talk to my group when we were talking about witches. The gardeners again. I think people love gardens and wandering around gardens and looking at plants. But I thought, what about the the people? who actually designed those gardens, who thought of putting a garden there in, in the first place, who imported the plants. And so I started looking at them um, and found that, that they're fascinating in their own right. John Ray, again, would feature in the Worthies course because he, he's, he's definitely a Worthy. This was a slab, I don't know if you can see, laid by David Bellamy. And it says, the most distinguished British naturalist of the 17th century. And, and John Ray was a very unassuming man. We have the, the plant classification system, the Linnaeus system, but Linnaeus based his system on John Ray's work. So, you know, I think there's a good case to call it the Ray system, really. Lovely man. Um, and then, I don't know if you know the lady up there, that's Beth Chatto, so one of our more recent gardeners. So these are the sort of people that I would like to talk about on the course. John Ray, uh, Baron Peter from Ingate Stone Hall, who had a very short life, but a very busy life, um, and spent a lot of it on his garden. Um, poor old Baron Peter really liked uh, white lilac trees, so he, he gathered seeds and he planted 2,000 seeds of his white lilac tree and they all came up purple, apart from three of them. <laughs> so he was an interesting man. Ellen Wilmot, 
in fact, they're all interesting personalities, these gardeners. Mm. <laughs> Perhaps they needed the gardens to calm them down. Um, Ellet Wilmot of uh, Great Worley, uh, Countess of Warwick. She really was a character of Eastern Lodge. Helen Robinson from Hyde Hall. And then Beth Chatto, of course. Um, and I don't know whether there would be scope within that course to go on, on trips to gardens. I, it would depend exactly where the course was and, and what the people wanted, but I'm very open to, to thinking about going out on trips and incorporating that into the course. That would be, it would be nice to actually see the gardens we're talking about. <coughs> this is Rivenhoe Park, uh, painted by John Constable when he was invited there by his, his <coughs> friends, the Rebal family. And there's Ingoatstone. Okay, so Essex churches. On the um, handout, I think they, they've missed off the Essex churches on the, the A4 printout you've got. So I, I particularly want to make sure you don't leave here without knowing I talk about churches because I love the Essex churches. And I think the Essex churches course offers something for everybody because it's not just, it's not about religion. It's not just about architecture. I think as much as anything, it's about people and it's about the social history of the area. So this is St. Peter on the Wall, which is our oldest church, of course, uh, when St. Sed came down and, and set it up there. Um, so however long the course is, and, you know, if you want a 20-week course on churches, I can fill it because there's so much to say. We have so many fabulous buildings, church buildings in Essex. Uh, but the way I would probably organise it is, is by a theme. So maybe we would look at the outside of the churches, church exteriors. So here's um, Lawford Church, which has, has got about a dozen different types of stone in its fabric. Things like Great Tay with its huge big Norman tower. Uh, this is Pentlow up on the Suffolk border with the round tower. Thaxted, one of the, the enormous wall churches, completely different style, completely different atmosphere. And um, Blackmore, one of our lovely wooden churches. Uh, so just looking at the outside of the church, there's so many architectural features and, and interesting things and a whole vocabulary <laughs> that goes with that. So architecture. Then we would have a look at what you get inside the church. Here's the font at Tollsbury, which comes with a little message on it warning you all not to swear when you go into church. <laughs> Otherwise, you might end up paying for a new font. <laughs> this is uh, the painting on the ceiling at Copford. And Braxted, just down the road here, we all, well, I passed the turning to Braxted on the way here. Uh, the vicar, the Victorian vicar, decided he was interested in painting, so he painted the whole inside of his church. Lovely. This is uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Dean at Great Waltham and their monument. There's lovely, lovely monuments in what you would think from the outside is a tiny parish church. You find something fabulous like this inside. Hester Salisbury at Stansted. This is Waltham Abbey. The back wall of the abbey with the wheel window there um, was a wall of the original Waltham Abbey itself. And this is just a tiny little portion that, that was used as the parish church. And contrast the magnificence of this with something simple like the Saxon little church at Chickney. There's such a huge variety of architecture here. Church clergy. I don't think I've got time to tell you who all these lovely gentlemen are. But I was really pleased that Ruth told us about uh, Emily Bronte just before me. This is um, her father, uh, Patrick Bronte, who was once the vicar of Wethersfield in Essex. He fell in love with the, the um, daughter of the minister of the Congregational Church and wanted to marry her and live in Essex, but her uncle wouldn't have it. So he went up to Yorkshire and married uh, somebody else up there. So I was thinking while Ruth was talking, well, if he'd married the girl in Essex, perhaps Emily Bronte would have been an Essex girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all these, these vicars have lovely stories to tell. Henry Bate Dudley, for example, who liked fox hunting and ended up 
following the fox up onto the roof of his church. So personalities, characters, social history, not just buildings. Oh yeah, these are some pictures of, of some trips that I went on. So the church is wherever the church course is, there's going to be a church within distance that's worth visiting, I can assure you. So it's lovely to go out and actually see the churches. And the churches love to see visitors. Um, so there's some visits we've been on. And... And that's just to remind you who I am. These are some Essex people in the Peasants' Revolt. I, I love that picture. I thought it's a lovely depiction of the Essex character. <laughs> <laughs> so churches, worthies, witches and gardeners. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me today. Um, so I'm going to offer three courses in archaeology, but before that I'm going to introduce myself because I'm a new face. So what qualifies me to teach archaeology? Well, I have a, obviously a PhD in archaeology that I uh, achieved at Durham. I've published on various Anglo-Saxon material culture um, in peer-reviewed uh, journals and books. I've worked at museums, I've done research at museums, and also local archives, the historic environment record, and also the PAS, which you might have heard of, the Portal Antiquity Scheme. I've worked in an archaeological field unit for, um, for some months after I finished uh, my PhD, uh, just under a year, working in various sort of archaeological digs in Essex, in Norfolk, in Suffolk, and in Cambridgeshire. Uh, my recent dig I did was in Felstead, actually, Felstead Church, where we were excavating a uh, Victorian cemetery, which was uh, uh, a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit scary, sort of digging a coffin, uh, which was sort of fairly recent. Uh, I've taught at various levels, university level, <coughs> uh, sort of from undergraduate to postgraduate levels. I'm teaching at the moment in Canterbury. Um, I'm teaching a course on medieval life and death. And I've been engaged with various sort of public uh, sectors, such as museums, offering sort of workshops, um, sort of hands-on workshops with artefacts. <coughs> so the three courses that uh, I'd like to offer to the WEA is first one's Introduction to Archaeology, and this is sort of very much you know sort of an accessible course which looks at the key methods and techniques that are used in archaeology. The second one is the funerary practices and art in the Anglo-Saxon and Viking worlds. So it's looking at the study of, sort of mortuary behaviour, mortuary ritual, types of art styles that are carried on grave goods, looking at cemeteries um, of this period, and, uh, and looking at sort of changes in identity from sort of Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Scandinavian. And the final course is um, life and death in medieval Europe. So it sort of follows on from sort of the Viking world, looking from 10th century up to the Black Death. And the types of things we look at in this course are sort of religious life, uh, looking at monasticism, um, we're looking at transitions from sort of a, a Christian to, uh, sorry, non-Christian to a Christian world. Also we're looking at development of urbanism from Wicks, like we have in Ipswich, to um, full-blown sort of um, towns, uh, like at Jorvik. <coughs> So I'd like to sort of introduce, I suppose, archaeology. This is the type of thing we'll be looking at in the introduction to archaeology. We'll be looking at right from the word go of how the discipline <coughs> itself came about. So we'll be looking at how the past perceived the past and look at sort of manuscripts and uh, documents of how people once sort of perceived the world surrounding them, such as monuments. And we have here, for example, like Stonehenge, how was Stonehenge perceived in the medieval era? <coughs> There's a 14th century manuscript uh, where it sort of depicts this idea of Merlin raising the stones at Stonehenge. Then later on in the 18th century, uh, we have sort of interpretations that Stonehenge is sort of a site of druidic sort of ritual acts. And all these interpretations are not necessarily founded in sort of... Um, uh, credible ideas, credible sort of uh, records, 
but with their still great surveys and uh, vital records of the past. We're we looking at the origins of museums, so from the idea of the cabinets of curiosity, so create, uh, sort of collecting and curating and exhibiting objects. We look at the Renaissance and the revival of Roman ideals of collecting and visiting these monuments and collecting works of art. So we're studying the idea of the past, so the development of the study of artefacts, look at how ideas change over time. For example, in the 17th century, um, there's a sudden change in the idea of what uh, prehistoric um, uh, sort of um, stone implements um, uh, were. For example, they were seen as uh, sort of thunderbolts raining down from the sky. But this kind of changed over time with uh, sort of an analogy, the use of sort of um, ethnology <coughs> and seeing how stone implements were currently being used in other cultures. We're looking at how the three age system came about, the Stone Age, Bronze Age and the Iron Age, impact of the Darwin and evolution and that's, that's effect on ideas of uh, changes over time and development of material culture. So we're looking at the key movers and shakers in archaeology, such as Mortimer Wheeler um, and other interesting figures. Also be co covering um, ideas of propaganda and nationalism, how archaeology is used in these particular agendas, such as Nazism. So once we cover the idea of the past in the past, and the development of the discipline, when we start to look at actual techniques and methods and theory that are currently being used. So we're looking at field archaeology, looking at different techniques, looking at surveying, field walking, earthwork surveying, geophysics, or uh, geophys as they call us on time team, um, and also uh, photography, such as aerial photography and how useful that is. Obviously, excavation, a very sort of core part of archaeology, uh, looking at how uh, techniques develop over time. Look at dating methods, such as dendrochronology, so how, uh, how we can date wood, and also radiocarbon dating. And most importantly, we're looking at stratigraphy. We're looking at part of the archaeological sciences of things, so we're looking at how plants and the study of insects and animal bones and what they can tell us about cultures and about identity. We're looking at cemeteries, human burial, and look at the sort of study of bones, osteology, so that we can tell uh, stories about sort of diet, migration and movement. And finally, perhaps one of the most important things to perhaps discuss during the uh, module is actually the archaeology in the public how archaeology is perceived, how it's portrayed in media, in <coughs> films, in TV series, and how community projects actually contribute uh, to society. And museums, which is really important, how things are being displayed and what agendas um, that museums have. So, this module is not just about me talking, it's about group discussions, uh, it's about some workshop, handouts, people you know, having sort of group, peer group discussions. It's also about field trips, uh, going to local museums, <coughs> and going to museums and sort of questioning how things are displayed, how things are curated, in order to examine how the past is, what you, is used now. Also, if possible, and uh, accessible, a trip to a local excavation, a local archaeological dig. And this is a great opportunity sort of to reinforce learning in the class. So this is a snippet preview from the other module that I'm offering, Funerary Practices and Art in the Anglo-Saxon and Viking Worlds. So in this module, we're looking at sort of burial evidence, cemeteries, 
artifacts, symbolism, functional role of objects, looking at belief systems, ideology. So the type of art styles we'll be looking at, for example, it's cremation art from sort of the, the departure of the Romans in the 5th century up to the 6th centuries, when decoration uh, was carried on cremation urns. So we're looking at how, how the images are portrayed on the urns, what types of images there are, looking at symbolism, what they may mean, and also about the rarity and narrative of these objects. For example, here we have uh, some sort of animal sort of images, but these are incredibly rare. More often we find just sort of geometric designs, uh, such as sort of, um, sort of round forms and uh, incised lines. Human imagery, for example, is extremely rare. In fact, this is the only uh, example of a, a full-bodied human figure which is the chairperson which sits on an urn lid from Spong Hill in Norfolk. This little face here uh, represents a, probably uh, some sort of uh, supernatural figure or god or something on those lines. But again, this is an extremely rare type of iconography. We'll be looking at the types of art styles in the early Anglo-Saxon period. <coughs> For example, style one, which was largely carried on uh, feminine sort of mortuary objects, such as brooches, which are found in the grave. Style one is characterised by the sort of mingling bodies of human and animal motifs, like a hybrid motif. And this very much keys into current thought about some sort of ideology of transformation and belief systems within the early Anglo-Saxon period. So we'll be looking at how to analyse, how to sort of get into the detail of artefacts. They're not just shiny, pretty objects that are displayed at, uh, in museums or national museums, but they carry narratives about how people perceive themselves and the world around them. <coughs> this is style two, which is very different from the hybrid sort of uh, motifs that we were seeing before. And this comes later, after style one. You can see it's very sinuous sort of interlace zoomorphic bodies. And this art style is not just a break from this uh, sort of strange hybrid creatures, but also was used on different types of artefacts. So then we see style two being used on masculine grave goods, such as the belt buckle at Sutton Hoo, which is what this is. And with you, I'd like to uh, go into the detail of the arts and actually identify the animals rather than, again, just seeing it as a shiny piece, but seeing it as a very intricate, sort of complex uh, object. So this is a sort of brief overview and a little snippet of what I'd like to offer in my three courses. Um, and, uh, well, thank you for listening. Um, my name is Ted Woodgate. Um, I was a history teacher in Essex schools for far too long, 30 years. And um, I've been with the uh, WBA for six years now, and um, I've got a variety of courses. But uh, uh, a couple of years ago, the idea struck me that my, my knowledge of cultural history was evolving, and I was pretty interested in the 50s and 60s. And of course, music is a dominant feature of the cultural history of that period. And um, uh, I suddenly thought that my son, Paul, uh, who uh, has an enormous knowledge of this, uh, he, he runs a, a blog on the internet called uh, I Level with the Stylus. He writes for pop magazines of quite considerable esteem, not the usual sort of stuff in the 60s. Uh, he would be the ideal person to have along. And we, we've actually done this course once. It's a one-day course only at the moment, and uh, uh, it, it did go down fairly well, so I hope you like it. What you're about to see, by the way, we don't actually talk about um, the mechanics of the course. 
Uh, what we're, we're going to do is going to give you a sort of 20 minute session of our style. And um, uh, what you'll see is we picked on one year in that span, 1950 to 64, and that would be a vehicle for expressing the way we would, we would approach that. It, I, I must stress that it doesn't actually form part of the actual course as it stands at the moment. So if you see it now, you won't see it again if you, if you like. <laughs> <once again. laughs> so, um, having said that, uh, Paul's going to start. Okay, thank you, Dad. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, yes, as Dad said, this is more of a, a stylistic approach for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and we like to run our day courses as a conversation so that we don't end up talking to you and you end up wishing for lunch <laughs> after the first five minutes. Um, so I'll ask you a question right at the beginning. Can somebody give me a year between 1954 and 1964? 63, 63, yeah. 63. 66. Hard oh, luck. No. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> don't win a prize. So, yeah, as, as Dad says, we, we chose 1956 as a snapshot. <coughs> And this is not the way we do the day course, so we won't go through it year by year by year, which again is by road and gets a little bit um, dull, we think, but this is uh, an idea from a stylistic approach. So, 1956, 11 years after the end of World War II, seven years before 1963 in the Karasi Knoll. Um, a few things about the year which might make you consider all the different things that were going on. So, uh, premium bonds were introduced for the very first time. Uh, and interestingly, petrol rationing was reintroduced, um, which uh, in these in these day and age, you, you might see that again soon. I don't know. Um, uh, in America, um, a year after the Rosa Parks incident, so the Supreme Court ruled that the Alabama segregation was unconstitutional. So um, it's just the beginning that the first few uh, rocks in the avalanche of the race. Um, issues in America, and I'm going to come on to that when I do my little bit in a minute. Um, Lennon and McCartney were yet to meet. Okay, so we didn't have anything remotely resembling the Beatles at this, at this point. Um, but however, you could argue that 1956 was year one of something called rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> uh, we could argue that it's the year that popular music crossed a certain line. So we're calling 1956, for the sake of this next 10 to 15 minutes, the eye of the storm. Okay, we've, we've, we've come a long way since the end of World War II. Uh, are we about to launch into something even bigger? Um, I'm going to give this to you. Okay. You're going to do that. Lovely, right. Thanks very much. So. Uh, in this course, you'll notice, you'll notice that Paul deals with all the exciting and happy stuff, <laughs> and I deal with all the boring politics and sociology. But here we go. Uh, this is uh, from uh, November 1956 in particular, um, and it's taken from. Uh, which one of Holmes is? That one of Holmes? I have no idea. <laughs> no, obviously not. Sorry. Dad also does all the technology. <laughs> 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 oh, this is the red thing that kind of goes in. That's the point. The point. Sorry, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I, 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 just, I read this a few weeks ago actually because there's a whole uh, industry uh, at the moment uh, of authors who are picking on years between the 50s and the 60s. Very handy for us. Uh, uh, a year or so ago, I bought a book that said 1963. That was the year that was. Uh, then 1965, the year everything changed. Uh, a book has just come onto the market about 1966, the explosion of, of, uh, of popular culture. But this one's from 56. They, 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 the authors here, uh, Beckett and Russell. Beckett is quite, Francis Beckett is quite a serious. Um, uh, uh, author Russell concentrates on the cultural history. We got together and they produced this book which says 1956, the year that changed Britain. And it's a contention, obviously. And they're homing on, uh, this is uh, particularly uh, Beckett here, homing on, on this quote uh, No one thinks, no one cares. No faith, no belief, and no enthusiasm. This was said by someone called Jimmy Porter. Mm. 
Who was Jimmy Porter? A character in the John Osborne play. Well done. <laughs> One up to Loughton, right? <laughs> we need the playwright. John Osborne. Well done. Well done. Yeah. So. Jimmy Porter, uh, look back in anger, 1956, uh, that had actually come on the West End a few months before and had taken the literary world by storm. It was a sensation. It was the first of the kitchen sink dramas. And as you can see, it, issued, it uh, Jimmy Porter's the leading character and it had this sort of message of complete uh, nihil uh, nihilistic doom about it. Uh, so this is what... Uh, uh, Beckett picks on it. No one thinks, no one cares, no faith, no belief, and no enthusiasm. You know, what a dismal picture. And then Beckett goes on to say, and in November 1956, you would not have thought you were in a country that had just done something. Uh, in other words, he, what he's saying here is that the reaction in Britain in 56 to events was, in fact, almost on a par with Jimmy Corbyn's comments. Uh, when you were living in a country, and this, well, this is the contention of Beckett that had just failed to prevent the destruction of one nation because its leaders were intent on the destruction of another. So what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> right, so here's, uh, using the card analogy that we should start with, we have the cards of dealt. The nation that was just destroyed is here. Okay, who's his character? He picked up Chris Job. Uh, he'd just come to the top in Soviet politics. A few months before, he had issued the famous secret speech to the 20th Party Congress in Moscow, in which he'd attacked everything that Stalin stood for. But it was secret. The fact that it was secret meant because it got out pretty quickly. <laughs> and uh, in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe, the, the, there was this message that uh, a new form of communism was going to take place. The old totalitarian system was going to go. That's what they thought. In particular, this chap thought. Anyone know who this is? Yes. Well done. Imre Nash. Imre Nash, the leader of the Hungarian communists, who believed in a, in a more sort of open society based on socialist principles, not the old totalitarian regime. Nash tragically thought that Khrushchev would allow him to introduce a new regime in, in, the East, in Eastern Europe. Here is the other big issue of the course of the year. This chap, Anthony Eden, Conservative Prime Minister. This chap, I read the photograph of him actually. <laughs> <laughs> President Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, United States of America. And the thing of course here they were arguing about it was the Suez Canal. The, uh, nationalist leader in Egypt, Egypt uh, Gamal Nasser, had uh, nationalised the canal. And Britain saw that as her lifeline, her trade li lifeline between the Mediterranean and Indian and, and uh, Pacific Oceans. And uh, Britain had always had this super superior role in Egypt. It was almost a colony. And of course, uh, basically, tragically, uh, Eden thought that it wasn't 1956, it was 1856. <laughs> and uh, take the example of good old Cam Palmerston, a few gunboats had sought these Egyptians out. Oh dear, oh dear. The world had moved on and Eisenhower certainly told even in no uncertain terms that the world had moved on. It was his re-election year, he was less than amused that Eden's moving around because it meant that uh, Eisenhower had to actually side with the Russians against Britain. Uh, so that's the big issue. Here's the wild card. Who's this? John Osborne. Osborne. Well done. Good stuff. How are we doing on time? <laughs> right. East West Division. I mean, this is uh, the sort of thing that in a, in a day course we could take much more time, of course, about the uh, division of Europe at the end of the Second World War. Uh, here is the great red block of the Soviets. Uh, empire with its satellite states here. Uh, these satellite states, of course, ruled uh, by sort of carbon copy communist regimes based on the idea of uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, they were seen as legitimate by the Russians because they, they were a buffer zone. <coughs> if, there was a, if there was ever a, an attack against the West, these countries would get it first. There was also a bargaining chip. 
Uh, the Americans, of course, had the atomic weapon in 1945. The Russians didn't have it until 49. So consequently, it was the Red Army, that's their big trump card, our trump card, and NATO, of course, was the atomic weapon until 55. So it was a balance of terror, a balance of power. Uh, here is uh, a famous shot from the Swiss <coughs> The Hungarian uprising, uh, you know, we can't go into all the detail. It fluctuated across the year of 56. There were times of great hope and expectation. Here you can see some of the rebels, ordinary men and women, on top of a Russian tank. Uh, the Radio Free Europe, which was financed, of course, by the CIA, was pumping an enormous amount of propaganda into Hungary that, you know, you have your revolution and the West will be behind you. Uh, they had a lot to answer for, really, here, because uh, it, it proved to be a false story. Ted, they say this, the thing was that Britain didn't care, was sort of not, not active. Well, I can remember, because I organised it, the collection at our school yes. for yeah. Hungarians yeah. Yeah. Um, revolution. And we had a whole lot of Hungarians come to our, our area. You see, that's yeah, exactly the sort of response we want to get out of the way of the controversy and memory, something like that. You know, this is, uh, Francis Beckett is painted with a very broad brush here, and I, you know, I accept that entirely. They had, had a, a camp just up the road from us in Belgium. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, David, your, your, your camp that they had to treat, treat Hungarian refugees. So Britain, not a side of it. We saw that last week, didn't we? Yes. 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 RNC officers were seconded to do it. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it is a very broad budget pattern. So, yeah, and exactly that, that illustrates beautifully what the one day course would do. It would hopefully stimulate discussion. So, yeah. uh, this, is, this is a shot of the uh, Suez Canal. You've got British uh, gunboats here. I, I must confess, I don't know which end of the Suez Canal this is, but uh, it gives you an impression of the military that was organised at the time. Um, someone told, again, on Ed Phelps, he said that he was actually on standby to be uh, called up to, to go to the Right, now, the culmination of this, when we get, when we get back to this quotation, uh, came in these dramatic two days. Uh, this day here, uh, November the 6th, 19, November 6, 1956, was the actual day of the presidential election of the United States of America. I say, uh, Eisenhower was particularly jumpy about this because he was portrayed himself as the peace candidate. And <coughs> that, uh, what Britain was up to, of course, uh, caused great embarrassment for him. On that very day, Soviet tanks in Budapest, only this time they, they weren't going to have people climbing on top. They came to put down the, the, the revolution. With a great deal of brutality, and uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds were killed. And uh, as you know, uh, people were that hungry in, in large numbers. The, the Soviet uh, clamp came down very, very convincingly on the 6th of November. The very next day, the UN demanded the withdrawal of British, French, and Israeli troops from the Suez Canal conflict zone. Now, again, without going into the details here, uh, Eden had come up with this remarkable scheme that if uh, he and the French uh, would come to the rescue of Israeli troops, Israeli troops invaded uh, Egypt, uh, were, were almost invited to get into trouble so Britain and France could ride to the rescue. That was the uh, idea. Of course, in the process, Britain would then uh, assert herself in, in the Suez Canal. Uh, there is evidence that, I, that Eden actually told mistruths in the Commons on this very issue. So, you know, he, he had really completely compromised his career. But what it meant, too, was that the UN demands, well, it's the UN Security Council that demands that, and it meant that the United States of America stood four square with the Soviet Union. And this is at the very point where uh, Roosevelt wants to get elected. Luckily for Roosevelt, it didn't affect, affect him. He was actually re-elected president of the United States of America, defeating Adlai Stevenson by nine and a half million votes, which is a considerable majority, and he got back every second term of office. What had transpired, of course, was that Britain's place in the world was now very much obvious in, in world terms. We were now very much a second-rate power. We had to ask America uh, 
to give the nod to anything that we wanted to do. The age of Palmerston and gunboat diplomacy was long gone. It began the gradual process where empire was actually offloaded in the 60s. We'd already lost India in 1947, but from 56 onwards, we, we, we came back from uh, uh, east of Suez. Uh, so Britain, Britain, five, five ago, yeah, so, yeah, very, or for you or me, for me? Very well. Very well, very quickly. Okay. My history teacher at Southern Grammar School used to say that had, uh, had there not been the Suez Canal crisis, Britain would have been to the rescue of the, the Hungarians. Highly unlikely, I think, Think about Czechoslovakia in 1968. Did we then? No. No. So here's the, here's the quotes again, and uh, just to, just for you to see again. But now, because uh, I've got the nod, we're going to say, "Well, is that true? Was Britain really that blue?" So, so yeah, thanks. So, um, conscious we've only got a few minutes left, but just to show the the juxtaposition that we try and do all the way through the day, of course. That might all sound particularly gloomy and world worrying and wearying, and of course it was if you were there. And, and you know, um, but actually there was a lot more going on as well, and we can focus down onto some things. So you might think there was no faith, no belief, and no enthusiasm. But if you were a teenager in the states in 1956, that was far from the case. So this is what they were worried about: <laughs> sex and rebellion. But they also had the issue of race to worry about. And in the UK, while all that was going on, we had folk clubs. <laughs> Which I'm not disparaging in any way, shape or form, because they were equally as important. But basically, in the UK and the US in 55 and 56, they were the blue touch paper years for a new musical genre. As a gentleman in the, in the crowd over there was quite willing to tell me a five minutes ago that it started a lot earlier, and he'd be absolutely right. The American DJ Alan Freed actually coined the term rock and roll in 1951-52. But it was 55 and 56 where it suddenly exploded. And it went from regional radio stations in the States into an international or a national and therefore international phenomenon. And obviously, you know, if you were there, it was music that shocked and it thrilled and it angered in equal measure. Um, but once that blue touch paper was lit, it was unstoppable. And one of the things that we've gone through in the course is exactly how the evolution of rock and roll started. So in the States, you had regional radio stations and you had different radio stations. You had, you had a radio station for rhythm and blues, you'd have radio stations for country and western, and you'd have pop ones. And they'd each have their own chart, unlike our Top of the Pops 40 over here. You just had the one. The Americans had chart upon chart upon chart because they liked statistics. And they were marketed to different income groups. So the rhythm and blues radio station would be marketed to black urban listeners. Country and western was largely to white rural listeners, usually on low incomes. And pop was the white urban middle class. Now, the white urban middle class were the important social aspect of this piece of history because they were the ones who had the purchasing and spending power to buy the records that the major labels wanted to bring out. And what happened was, to enable that money to be spent and the economic boom to be used, if you like, in the mid-50s in America, is that they very cleverly turned rhythm and blues and its raunchy rhythms and barely disguised allusions to sex in the lyrics into rock and roll by combining it with vocal deliveries and the country rhythms of country and western. And then what they did was they appropriated both of those from the black artists in the rhythm and blues era and gave it to white artists and ironically what we ended up with was what everybody was worried about which was rock and roll but actually rock and roll was just a sanitized version of rhythm and blues for the masses now that's a contentious point but it's it's an argument that we'd like to discuss during the day so we will go through something like that um, we'll also talk about the whitening of r and so i've mentioned it there this is exactly what happened you know, most people here will be um, very au okay with these names. Chuck Berry, Little Richard. This is Fats Domino, by the way. Just about to sing Blueberry Hill. I won't play it now because I don't think we've got time. Um, but these artists were the ones that had the dangerous edge. The ones that the teenagers loved. These are the guys that came out with the songs that everybody wanted. However, you couldn't sell them nationally because they were black. And that was, a, you know... Uh, it's a, an unfortunate truth, but it's, it was the truth. 
So what they did was they gave their songs and their styles to these guys. Um, most of you might, or some of you might remember Bill Haley in 1955 in the UK, Rock Around the Clock, Blackboard Jungle the film. Bill, Bill, Bill was quite a comfortably middle class guy, in fact, and, and quite dull in inverted commas. But when, but when he when he hit the UK in '55, everybody went bonkers because it was, I saw him. you saw him. There you go. There you go. Well, you've, you've got one up on me because I wish I had. So, Carl Perkins, Pat Boone, Jeremy Lewis. All these sorts of guys. So we'll go through this, and I've got to wrap up. Just a bit of um, so I won't go through this, but just to give you a, a taste, we concentrate on things like Sun Records. So we'll, we'll, we'll go off on piece. We'll go off piece and do a bit of detail like that. Um, we'll, we'll come back repeatedly to the race issue in the states um, and what happened with those things, uh, and then obviously we'll do the UK as well. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll mention Lonnie. We'll mention. Yeah, we'll mention, we'll mention how it all ties back to commercial success and the social aspect. Uh, and we'll do the skip forward, we'll do the folk explosion, but we always bring it back, <coughs> always bring it back to how, how what was going on in places like Suez and Hungary and in the House of Commons and the, the Senate and, you know, and all that stuff in the States, it's always brought back to how it is reflected in the music, because you, you, know, you might be surprised, you might not be surprised, but there's always a link. So that's the idea of the two people. This is just a snapshot, we do lots of different things, we have video, we have audio, we do quizzes, because Dad likes a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> we don't move methodically from one year to the next, we take a very thematic approach. But we're always referring back to how that music is reflected in the social, political, and economic change. Okay, and I think that's probably I've probably run over, so apologies for that. But that's that's very good. So I'm just taking five minutes to introduce myself to everybody as a new tutor. Um, the details for the courses that I'm offering are actually outlined in the handouts that you've all got today, but I do have additional handouts here uh, for anybody that's interested in having a look through. So it's okay with someone leave these here for anybody that's interested. Um, they are contemporary Japanese literature, post-Soviet surrealist literature with a focus on Russia and Ukraine. Postmodernist detective fiction, which in itself is probably quite a loose definition, but we're looking at exploring the self through narrative and themes such as those. Uh, contemporary Chinese women writers, uh, which is quite an unusual course, um, and actually one of the books that's outlined in the leaflet has been changed, and this has been amended on the handout that I've provided here. And finally, exploring the modernist city, New York. Berlin, Paris and London, with one novel <coughs> representing each of those cities during the modernist era. Um, so that's just a brief introduction to what I'm offering for the next academic year. Uh, the details for my availability are on the back of the handout. Um, I have ticked various branches that I'm willing to travel to, but I am also quite open to negotiation on these. So if anybody is interested and I haven't actually ticked your branch, please do still inquire, uh, because it might be that simply I'm not quite sure where you're based. <laughs> um, so thank you for allowing me to introduce myself quickly before I leave, um, and I hope that some of you will be interested in some of the courses that I'm offering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm Susan Pine, and I'm a workers' educational success story because I got my A-levels through Workers' Educational Association, and that led me into taking a degree in education and a successful career in teaching. So if it wasn't for the WEA, I wouldn't be standing here today. So, uh, yeah, so I'd, I would like to give something back. I'm offering uh, three courses. The first one I'm calling Adventures in Philosophy. Now that can run as a seven week <coughs> or a 10 week course. Um, my second one is Qigong Chinese Exercise, of which more later. 
And I'm offering as a talk, uh, I'm also a water diviner. So I'm offering uh, as, as a talk, uh, talks on dowsing, what dowsers do, what they don't do, uh, different things you can do with dowsing. Uh, say that one would be a talk. So philosophy. For years, I've started my philosophy lessons like this. I'm sure you know the scene. It's the first uh, scene of The Hobbit, isn't it? There's Bilbo Baggins sitting outside the front door of Bag End, and along comes Gandalf. And Gandalf is a bit of a philosopher, because Bilbo says, good morning. And Gandalf says, what do you mean? And look what he does, it's very clever. Do you wish me a good morning, meaning one? Or do you mean it as a good morning, whether I want it or not, meaning two? Or that you feel good this morning, meaning three? Or that it is a morning to be good on? Four, possible meaning. It's clever, isn't it? It's clever. Because what Gandalf has uh, highlighted there is the fact that it's not obvious what we mean all the time. It certainly it's not obvious what we mean by good. Uh, so, this is the first big step in philosophy, is learning to ask the philosopher's question. What do you mean by? Example, knock, knock, knock on the door. You open the door, there he is, the young man in the very, very smart suit carrying the briefcase, possibly two of them, and they say to you, do you believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that might throw you a bit. Now, if you say yes, then they have their prepared script that they work down. If you say no, they have another prepared script. But you, if you're a philosopher, you don't ask that. If you're a philosopher, you say straight away, it's second nature to you. What do you mean by? What do you mean by God? Because it's not obvious, is it? What God means to you may not be the same thing as what God means to another person. And it's certainly not going to be what a Hindu thinks of as God, or what a Muslim thinks. So learning to ask that question is a massive, massive step. And I'm, I'm saying to you, you know, take that point home, please. Because you can use this, what do you mean by, to challenge people in every walk of life. Challenge your doctors and your dentists. <laughs> challenge, challenge the town council, challenge the politicians. You know, what do you mean by bypass? <laughs> what do we mean by air raids on Syria? <laughs> I shouldn't say that one. But do you see, it's a very, very, very important, and if you look at any good work on philosophy, this is where they start defining the parameters of the terms that they're engaging with. So, as I say, for years and years and years, I've been teaching people to start philosophy by starting to ask that question. You'll be horrified how many people are thrown if you ask that question. So, um, in philosophy, uh, one of the first things as well that, that I tell students is, how are we discussing? It's friendly discussion, isn't it? <laughs> that, not that. When we discuss in philosophy, we put an idea into the melting pot. It's like we've got an invisible plinth. We put the idea on the plinth, and then we throw stones at it. Or sometimes we fr throw glitter at it <laughs> to see how good the idea is. And that process of dispute and challenge and scrutiny helps us refine our thinking. So it's very, very important to, to um, uh, you know, let people know and inform students. You have to criticise the idea. You never criticise the person. And if everybody knows that, if everybody understands that, if, if a, a person in the class says, well, I posit that... Uh, saying to the class that I'm putting this idea on the pedestal, then we can discuss in a friendly way and it doesn't get nasty. Now, uh, again, I decided rather than go through the whole gambit, I will show you a bit about how I teach. I firmly believe that the great ideas of Western philosophy are accessible to everybody, providing you present them in the right way, in the right sort of language. And this is one of the most famous ideas. This idea has shaped Western culture. And it comes from Plato. It's in Plato's famous work, The Republic, about that thing. Ignore the writing. The writing's in Spanish. I can't speak Spanish. Maybe some of you do. Uh, but it was the best picture that was on the internet. <clears throat> so, uh, Plato uh, uh, uses the analogy of the cave to describe our situation in life. And it's, the situation starts off down here. I hope people at the back can see. There's a wall there in this cave. And there are some prisoners sitting with their back to the wall and they've been chained there since they were children. They know nothing of the world outside. They cannot move their heads, they cannot get up. 
All they can see are shadows on the wall of the cave in front of them. And those shadows are made by a fire over here. And that fire is um, throwing the shadow of, of objects that are being marched up and down the passageway behind the wall. And those images there are casting their shadows on the wall. Now, the poor people sitting in the cave, all they know of reality, all their understanding of the world is, is what they see on the wall. And they hear voices, and they, they imagine that you know these images here are talking to them in some way. This is their picture of reality. This is what they think the world is. And Plato said, well, most people are like the prisoners chained to that wall. Reality is so much greater than they can imagine. But they think that the shadows are reality. But if you look at the picture, look what's going on here. Because there are this gang of people here walking up and down carrying statues. What is going <coughs> on? These people here are directly manipulating these people's view of the world. Yeah? What are our shadows on the walls of our cave today? Our shadows come through the television, don't they? Our shadows, and certainly shadows for teenagers, come on Facebook and Twitter and in paper. So who is manipulating those images? And what I'd like to ask as well is we've got this gang of people walking up and down uh, holding the images. Maybe they are a little bit more free than the prisoners, but who's giving the orders here? Who is giving the orders? So there's a political message here. There's a social message here. The story goes on. Uh, one prisoner is released. And the first thing he does is he stands up and he turns around and he sees the fire and he sees the figures and his view of reality is completely shattered. What he thought the world was like isn't what the world is like at all. And Plato said, well, that's what happens when you start to learn philosophy. You get up, you turn around. Your view of the world is, is challenged and shattered. Yeah. And the poor prisoner then, you can see he's dragged kicking and screaming out. And the, the, it's a too long a story to tell properly. But eventually he goes into the bright sunlight and he looks around and he sees the real world. And that, says Plato, that is the enlightened philosopher. That is the person who is truly wise, who has true understanding. And then, of course, like Buddha, after his moment of enlightenment, the philosopher can't leave it there because he has a sense of social purpose. He has to come back down into the cave. And the last line in the story of the cave is quite telling because he goes all the way back down here, his eyes have to readjust to the darkness again, and he tries to tell the prisoners here, hang on, there's a world outside. And it's too much for the prisoners. It challenges their view of the world too much that they get angry and they threaten to kill the philosopher. And that tells us a great deal. It tells us a, a lot about spiritual progress. You know, think what happened to Jesus. <coughs> it tells us about politics. It tells us about our own personal development. And as we grow and develop as people, it's important for our ideas to be challenged again and again because it's only as a result of that challenge that you can reach through to a higher level of understanding. So that's part of what we're doing in philosophy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so in my philosophy lessons, ideas would be a main component as well. Uh, language skills if it's needed, uh, critical thinking <coughs> skills, and learning things like formal fallacies of, of, of argument, that kind of thing. Uh, I can make this course um, as academic as you like. I can um, dilute the uh, processes down into simple language so it's accessible for people who have not had a lot of formal education. I can do that. Uh, I'm so a very experienced teacher. So you tell me what you want and I can gear the course to you. Um, there, you go. there we go. Um, and so in a seven stroke ten week course, uh, these are some of the philosophers that we would be looking at. Uh, my plan is to take one philosopher per week as the main one, but inevitably other philosophers creep in. Yeah, so one week it might be Plato with a bit of Aristotle. Um, you know, next, next week it might be Davis Hume with a bit of a modern philosopher, A.J. Eyre, in there. 
Uh, as you can see, so it's quite a range, really. And again, if there's somebody your branch particularly would like to look at, do tell me. I, I can put in whoever you like. So that's a flavour of philosophy. Hope it's intrigued you. So, um, equally intriguing is another course that I'm offering. And this is Dragon and Tiger Medical Qigong. And there's the dragon. <laughs> there's the dragon and there's the tiger. And you can see them in the yin yang uh, symbol. Because Qigong comes from China, it comes out of Taoist philosophy, where you've got a balance between uh, yin forces and yang forces. The yang forces are expansive, the yin forces contract really both. So it's a traditional exercise system. If you've ever tried to do Tai Chi, you know it, it takes a long time to learn a Tai Chi form. It can take you up to a year. Yeah, I see some people nodding. <laughs> uh, Qigong is much simpler. Uh, the exercises are fairly quick to learn, and once you've got them, you can mix and match what you like. This kind of Qigong, the Dragon and Tiger, is a medical Qigong because it's used in China to treat serious medical conditions. People in recovery from very serious illnesses are treated in, with Qigong. In China, if you go to a doctor, you could get a traditional Western remedy prescribed, you could get a Chinese remedy, or you could give, be given a note to take to the Qigong, uh, Qigong master and given exercises instead. Um, I use this uh, Qigong every day, and it's transformed my health. Um, <laughs> four years since I had a cold. <laughs> touch wood, touch wood. <laughs> I'm tempting fate saying that, aren't I? Yeah. So, here we go. There we go. So, here's some of the things it does. As we've said, it's used in hospitals to aid recovery. I mean, I, I cannot speak highly enough of this particular kind of Qigong. There are many out there. It's non-strenuous. You do not need to be an Olympic athlete. I'm going to demo this in a minute for you. Uh, I can adapt. I'm a qualified Qigong teacher. I've been teaching for three years and training in Qigong for 11. This can be adapted to suit all levels of fitness. You can even adapt some of these exercises for the bedridden. So it's a very, very versatile. Nobody needs to be put off because they've got a gammy leg or a gammy knee or they're in a wheelchair. We can adapt it. And one of the things it really does, as I say, it boosts the immune system. It really it kick-starts it and um, helps you fight off colds and flu and things like that. It's, it's wonderful stuff, this. So, tones and strengthens the inner organs as well as the muscles. And you notice it. I mean, East Anglia is pretty flat. But if you go on holiday to the mountains, you climb a mountain after you've been doing Qigong for a couple of years, you're up there, there's no sweat. <laughs> it's good. It calms the mind, and also it can be a way into meditation. There's a meditation tradition that goes on with Qigong. So what's Dragon and Tiger look like? Hello, camera. It looks like this. So here we start. This is exercise number one. Look at that. That's not going to kill anyone, is it? That's easy. It, I, believe you me, it's a sight easier <laughs> to demo than it is to learn. But this is the one, this dragon and tiger number one, this is the one that really has a very strong action on the immune system. That's number one. Number two. There's number two. Number three. Well, this is the most demanding on the back, but how I teach it for people with gammy knees and gammy backs is you can prop a leg on a chair. This one, you can prop a leg on a chair and get um, the same effect, the exercise, if you need to. Number three, this exercise is deceptively simple. It's called Mother Tiger Parts the Cubs. Ah. <laughs> uh, but if you do this exercise properly, it, it massages your heart. What else is massaging your heart outside a hospital? Number five. Number six. This is the most intellectually demanding, as you can see. <laughs> yes. Number six. And number seven. But the easy version, yeah, for those who can't stretch. And that's, that's the dra that is the dragon and tiger. So there you go. <laughs> 
So if anybody's looking for a fitness class to run in their branch, um, as I say, I think this is very, very special. Uh, many, many kinds of Qigong out there. Some are more complicated than others. But seven exercises done every night. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to run the set, and it keeps you really healthy and flexible. <coughs> Nearly there. So my third thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what have I got two of those? I must have put the second slide on and forgotten to... Oh, there I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, my third thing. Um, I'm a water diviner as well. And I do go out dousing, detecting underground water. I do go out locating boreholes and things for farmers. <laughs> it's very, very scary because you've got to get it right. Because if somebody's hiring a great big drill and a gang of men on your say-so, you've got to be pretty jolly sure that the water is where you say it is. So I'm offering uh, talks on dowsing and some of the things that dowsers do, what they do, what they don't do. So what actually is it? Uh, detecting energies that are not immediately apparent by the use of a handheld rod or a pendulum. There are various designs of rod. That is a traditional, a, a, a variation on the traditional um, hazel twig, except mine's plastic. You can see I've got uh, all rods in my, my belt there as well. That is me actually going fine in the water, as you can see. Um, so detecting water, but other things too. What we think is going on as dowsers, we think we are responding to very, very minute changes in the electromagnetic background. Until um, science uh, allows somebody funding to research this properly, we will not know. We are doing a lot of research of our own on this. But it is absolutely fascinating. Does it work? You better. <laughs> so, um, a particularly interesting branch of dowsing, and one I'm sure you, your branches will be interested in hearing about, is the difference between a ley line and an earth energy. Uh, dowsers can just pick up both of these. A ley line is a line of sight anyone can see. If you're in Ipswich or Norwich, look out. There's some fabulous ones there. An earth energy line is a band of energy that we can detect by dowsing, but no other means at the moment. The most famous ones you might have heard of are the Michael and Mary lines found by a man called Hamish Miller uh, back in the early 1970s. Hamish went on to found a parallel community. But these two uh, lines... Uh, run the length of UK and right round the world and back, you know, leaving, leaving Hopton, coming back in at Cornwall there. Uh, and as you can see, they link all kinds of famous places. So, um, uh, again, there's bags and bags and bags of stuff on Michael and Mary lines on the internet if you're interested. Uh, again, more than I can possibly go into, but I could explain many of the highways and byways of that. But these earth energy lines are fascinating dowsers at the moment because <coughs> they're not one line, they're three-dimensional, they have height as well. And we, we can detect the height. And they appear to be composed of different sub-bands of energy, some of which are active, some of which are not, some of which are only active on the full moon. I say, it gets very interesting. So we've said they have height. Um, now, the leading edge of an earth energy band is immensely significant because if something has gone wrong with that energy, if it's cut, run through a plague pit or through a battlefield and has become a bit polluted like that, and your bed or your office table is over the leading edge, that, in some people, might lead to a few uh, problems. So, um, again, all, all that stuff we can sort. And they do move about slightly. Um, some of these lines can move while you're on them. It's, it's, it's interesting, don't you? Um, this is, as you may know it, it's Spitalfields Market, close by Liverpool Street Station. Yeah, if you come out of Liverpool Street, turn left, uh, walk up, cross the road, it's about two turnings down, and you will see the goat on the pole. And there's a Hawksmoor church there, Hawksmoor New is Earth Energy, so he built that church uh, with them in mind. Um, there's a, a wacky great Earth Energy band that comes down this street here. And you can see where the man is standing. That would be where the leading edge is. That's the, the, the significant point there. So if I were him, I wouldn't hang about there too long. <laughs> uh, but this, uh, it, this earth energy line here, having come right through Whitechapel, having come run very close to the site of one of Jack the Ripper's murders, 
which was just opposite the church that's around there. This is not a nice band, that one. It's what uh, Darius has called dirty energy. Yay. So, as we've said, uh, an energy might cause problems for someone exposed for long periods. If you were sleeping there, or you've got your desk, or you're sitting there to be that spot to watch TV. Um, if you have got a mucky earth energy line running over a place where there's an underground spring, a blind spring under there, that the combination of those energies can be a bit yucky. And then if you go and you put your computer um, tower over that spot as well, you have uh, got additional electromagnetic <coughs> sim sim uh, signals coming off electrical equipment, and that can make quite an unpleasant cocktail. Uh, and that's at the cutting edge of dowsing, as it were. And that, you know, we, we are, uh, one of the things we do as dowsers is disentangle that kind of energy knot and sort it out. So as I say, I'm offering dowsing as a talk. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, so I think, what else? Yeah, that's about it, isn't it? Yeah, that's about it. So there I am. Uh, that's what I'm offering. And thank you very much for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed my talk. As it was very timely, um, I would read a little bit from an extract, Alex, about a very nice email that um, Branch sent to you this week. Maple says, Branch, I don't know if there's anyone here from Maple says today, but Maple said sent an email to our office this week just to let them know what a great success Alex was as our tutor this term. Um, he has extensive knowledge, presents his material exceptionally well, and our numbers kept up as evenings grew dimmer and darker, a testimony to Alex's great talent. So, <laughs> just thought that was nice to share because I know you're really interested in comments and feedback from other branches about tutors. Yeah, Maple Stick was probably the most wonderful experience I've had as a tutor yet. Uh, I mean that. Uh, now, I've been tutoring now for uh, about three or four years. Uh, it's been a wonderful, ex a wonderful experience uh, teaching for an organisation with such amazing ethics. And the, I actually now offer three courses to the WEA. Uh, I moved to Saxmunden about uh, six months ago, then I was living in Leyston. So I've come quite a way. I live up in North East Suffolk, which enables me to make this course very, very rich, because I'm living effectively very close to the Suffolk Heritage Coast. Uh, but my mother lives in Bocking, and my fa I have family in Bocking, so it enables me to literally cover Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex throughout the entire year. And I can tie so many things in together. So getting to some of your Essex branches would not be a problem at all, because I feel that I'm on a mission to get the word out about some of these amazing parts of East Anglia. <coughs> so effectively, what you're going to get each week is a guided tour of a region of East Anglia, but a very rich guided tour that's meaty and colourful and hopefully stimulating, therapeutic, I hope it's therapeutic, that's one of the aims, and also very, very interactive because I do ask lots of questions, and then there's a little bit of repetition as the course progresses. Now, the first main course that I offer, this is the one I've been running for a few years now, is the wildlife and habitats of East Anglia. And when you look at that slide, you can see diversity straight away. And one of the things I want to portray through the backbone of this course is biodiversity in action today. Erosion. Climate change, all these things brought together, and also management of these areas, and some of the inspirations uh, of, uh, for these areas of habitat, like Ted Ellis, for example, uh, who uh, was a very, very influential man on the Norfolk Broads. So one of the sections we look at is actually the Suffolk and Norfolk Broads. <coughs> Featuring the Suffolk Heritage Coast, an area of outstanding natural beauty, an AONB, which embraces some amazing habitats in a very sh uh, small area. So you've got a very rich area called Dunnage and Westleton Heath. You have RSPB Minsmere as well. So effectively, as part of this course, we also look at the conservation organisations that will be looked at during the remainder of the 10-week course. So it is very, very meaty. We also then look at wildlife habitats around the estuaries. 
the, mult the salt marsh plants, especially, that many of our wintering wildfowl and duck and geese rely on. Then we look at an area on the Norfolk Suffolk border called the Brex. This is an area of heathland with a very, very sandy soil. And it, because the soil here is so rich, uh, it also enables certain species to thrive, especially in the way of certain heathland plants, and then consequently, <coughs> consequently birds and butterflies. Now, birds and butterflies are very heavily focused within this course, especially identification of butterflies <coughs> and moths, and identification of birds by, by sight, song and call. So I will be playing some bird song in the, in the course and some of my own impressions as well. So you will get a big Percy Edwards thrown in for good measure. Uh, so we, we look at the Brex, then we go out to sea, thanks to an amazing influential man in Suffolk who's a scuba diver called Rob Spray. And he does underwater photography. He's an incredible man, and I've got some of his slides of underwater. But then we also look at some of the cetaceans, including the humpbacked whale that's been off the East Anglian coast now for three years, feeding on mackerel and herring spawn, and it's probably likely to live there until it dies. Because our, as our climate warms up, we have larger numbers of mackerel and herring migrating through the North Sea, and this species is just hanging around feeding to its heart content. So we look at cetaceans and, and uh, whales and dolphins, porpoises, and some of the species you would find around some of the coral areas, especially around Sizewell and Dunwich, because there's a few corals around some of the wrecks off of Dunwich Heath and Dunwich Village. So we look at the estuary salt marsh of Essex, around uh, Dabchick Saltings on Mersey, around Old Hall Marshes. So there's, there's a lot and lot of different nature reserves that will be pulled into this course and explored and discovered from the comfort of your chair. Then we look at the Norfolk Broads and Coast, including the more coastal Suffolk Broads of Cove, Hythe and Benica, and how they've been heavily breached and now sadly turned into a salt marsh environment. Then we look at ancient woodland sites of, uh, and salt marsh of Essex. So then we look at some of the ancient woodlands in South Essex and some of the butterflies that thrive here, like the brimstone butterfly, the white admiral, and the recently reintroduced uh, purple emperor, which is now uh, actually turned up wild at some of the reserves and has been reintroduced to a few others. So also the course will then look at reintroduction of different species. For example, the stone curlew, which now breeds on uh, areas of Suffolk Heath, like Wheating, he uh, Wheating Heath in Norfolk, and areas like Wesselton Heath as well. So you've got the Norfolk Wildlife Trust of Wheating Heath, and then you've got uh, Dunwich Heath and Wesselton Heath. So all these areas are explored, looking at the different flora and fauna that would be found over a typical year. Then we go to look at some of Octavia Hill's work, the lady who set up the National Trust, who was born in Wisbeach. Uh, and we start to explore some of the areas that she influenced and embraced very heavily and pumped lots of work and time and passion into around the Cambridgeshire Fens. So what you've got here is a series of up to 10 sessions which look at different habitats each, each week and then cross over with different species. Starting at Minsmere, RSPB Minsmere. So that's an, a bird's eye view of RSPB Minsmere. You can see sizable power station in the distance there. And then an area of ancient woodland, and more recent uh, woodland, called Sizewell Belts, which is managed by EDF, sorry, owned by EDF, and managed by the Suffolk Wildlife Trust. And then if you come this way over here, you would eventually end up at a place called Dockerous Dyke and then Dunnage Heath. So all these areas are explored, looking at the rich colour of the plants as well over a typical year. Looking at estuary sites here at Snake Maltings. So this is on the River Ould, and if you go over this side, it takes you towards the village of Snape. 
And if you come back here, it will take you to Newton Garrett's amazing, formidable building of snake mortings. A very influential engineer who has his uh, museum in the village of Leyston. Sorry, the town of Leyston, or the long shop. And then we also look at an area nearby called Iken Cliffs and Blacksall Common, famed for Nightjar, one of the best places to see Nightjar. So I also encourage you, after the course, to explore these areas as well. The area is known, as you can see, for its beautiful Suffolk skies. So there's lots of examples of Suffolk skies used in this uh, uh, course to show just how beautiful the area is and how rich and varied it can be for wildlife. Like these two birds here. Any ideas what these are? Hobbies. No, hobbies are much smaller. Mm, marsh these are marsh harriers, food passing. Food passing marsh harriers that you would see usually over the reed beds at Minsmere around the middle of May, where a male flies overhead and a female comes underneath, turns upside down and catches some prey and flies off. And I will ex uh, explore the different, uh, the different mating gestures of different species that you would find in these areas as well. And also, the habitats of very, very vulnerable reed-dwelling birds, like the bittern. This can be found at quite a few different reserves now, but open doesn't breed at many in East Anglia. <coughs> There's wintering birds at Fisher's Green, uh, on the Lee Valley, but we have a very, very rich population that still breed at Minsmere. And this is a species which will be looked at with different views, different slides of how these birds will be feeding and how they actually communicate when they crouch down and boom in the dense reeds. Then we also look at reed, reed, other reed bed habitats. This is the Blythe Estuary here, just not far from Hen Reed Beds, which is on the left. And this is a place where you would look for birds like the bearded reedling. Uh, a, get a bird that many people come to Suffolk to see. And here you can see two young birds that have uh, been <coughs> nesting in the reeds, and they've been brought up there. And here you can see an adult. So I'll be teaching how to identify these species, and where to go to look for different species as well. And also, some of the conservation techniques that have been put up to encourage species, like coppicing and pollarding, reed bed clearance, and then now reconstruction of new barn owl boxes to bring barn owls back to areas that were once uh, that were suffering because of, uh, of uh, flooded meadows, but where these birds are now being brought back to an area to thrive again and to rear their young. I remember one year I was at Minsmere and a barn owl was feeding five, uh, four or five young and it actually flew a stoat across the river in its talons and took it up to a nest box. And the reason I knew it was a stoat is because it had a black tip on its tail. So that's another thing I would do in this course, is look at identification of mammals. And also how to identify different species of deer. So there we look at woodland sites as well. So you can see there's a lot involved in each section of this course. And there is a barn owl in flight. A barn owl which has suffered very heavily through the demolishing of hedgerows. Like the yellow hammer has as well. We also look at estuary sites uh, on the Ore Estuary. This is Burrow Hill. So we'll be looking at estuary sites and the wading birds that you would find here. <coughs> and here as well. And some of the mammals that would feed around here. And some of the butterflies that would also be found around a reed bed environment as well. Because some are found around reed bed environments. Especially on the Cambridgeshire Fens and on the Norfolk Broads at Hickling Broad and Ranworth Broad. So when we look at the broads, I would also be talking a little bit how the broads came to be. For when it was a large scale peat excavation, and how it has now become one of the most conserved areas for wildlife in East Anglia today. Here is a view of an area of Albra at the sailing club. But this isn't actually called Albra here. Does anybody know what it's called? You're on the northern tip of Orford Ness, another area that's looked at in this course. This is the tiny hamlet of Slawdon. And Slawdon is just outside uh, Albra. And this is an area where you can walk around the River Ord 
around a rich area of salt marsh that takes you towards slate maltings along the sailor's path to an area called Hazelwood Marshes, which has recently been very heavily breached. So we'll, then we'll be looking at breaches in the sea walls that are natural and also ones that are deliberate, and that is known as managed retreat. Some of you may have heard about what happened at Fingal and Wick last year. They had a managed retreat to create new habitats for wading birds, ducks and geese. So this is all thrown into this course. So we'll then look at plants that grow in the reeds, like the yellow flag iris. Uh, also the yellow horned poppy, which you can see here growing on Albury Beach. But the course can be also tailored around where you live as well, uh, as we'll see in a minute. So there, so there is a view across the Ald Estuary, and there's a beautiful walk that takes you from Slate Mortings out to Icon Church, St Botolph's Church, probably one of the most beautiful in Suffolk. And here is a view on Dunnage Heath. So if you were to come out on a tour with me, I would do identification of heather, which is something I cover in the indoor class as well. But also I would encourage you to go and smell this gorse, because mm. it has the most amazing, rich, vo vibrant smell of coconut. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to encapsulate all the senses when you do this, these tours as well, is uh, taste, uh, sorry, smell, uh, sight and sound, all combined to give a very rich, meaty course. And here are some of the examples of bell heather that grow very, very well on this area of heathland and amazing for bees and butterflies especially. There's the hobby that someone mentioned earlier, a species that relies on reed beds and heathland where you have remnants of woodland around the perimeter. So these are areas where hobbies would breed. But one of their main f foods are dragonflies and damselflies. They do occasionally feed on hirundines. Does anybody know what I mean when I say hirundines? Swift swallows and martins, correct. And they actually feed on the wings, you can see here. So we'll be looking at these birds of prey as well, that rely on these habitats. And then butterfly identification. This is a, uh, a gatekeeper butterfly which is found regularly around heathland sites of East Anglia. And then birds like the bullfinch and the nightjar. <laughs> it's a nightjar, also called the goat, goat sucker. Yeah, it was once known for sucking the udders of sub saharan cattle and giving them a disease called puckerage. Here is an ancient woodland in Essex. So we look at habitats like this for uh, bluebell woods, or also known as the wood hyacinth. And then birds that thrive on these areas like the nuthatch. And then we look at uh, areas of uh, Scots pines, which is a, and also Thorpness Mere, uh, around the edge of uh, Thorpness, Kingfisher, and then some drainage mills on the Norfolk Broads, and the habitat around these, which you can see here. But these are just some of the plants like the uh, southern marsh orchid, that's a, that's a spotted orchid there, and then also looking at the brex. Some of the uh, birds, the golden oriole, and that was a stone curlew there, and the golden pheasant. And then we also look at pingos on the bre in the brex, geological features of the brex formed from during the last, last ice age. Does anybody know where we are here? I said Orford Ness, correct. So we look at these weak areas, and here Blakeney Point, bringing back habitats for birds like the little tern, and then for common seal. So then we start to look at identification of seals during the end of the course. The second course I offer is along a similar theme, but it involves a, a series of outdoor field trips each week in your area. But the first and final sessions can be indoors as an introduction and a conclusion of the course. So these are weekly trips that can be organised in advance to a range of habitats like Finger and Hoewick, uh, the Colne Estuary, Flatford Mill and Alsford Creek. 
probably one of the most beautiful creeks in Essex, I would say. This is opposite Fingering Her Whip. And also the Nays here. And then the third and final course I offer is a practical course, a very heavy, pra heavily practical course, where we look at illustrating wildlife and historical buildings. And then I will teach you a range of techniques. We'll be working from existing artwork, from photos, and from still life. Uh, and I will teach you techniques for illustrating in pen and ink using stippling and cross hatching. These are examples of my work here. Then we'll go on to look at acrylic and watercolour and another <coughs> medium called sunset and silhouette in mixed media. So then here you've got the grey heron which is painted in acrylic and the background is a watercolour wash with pen and ink over the top using stippling and cross hatching. So this is a very, very rich practical course that looks at a range of different techniques in colour and black and white. Also exploring the therapeutic benefits of illustrating in these styles. These also can be used as one-day schools as well. They can be taken as one-day schools. So, like I said, I'm happy to travel around to different areas of Essex. And I hope what I've shown you is of interest of you. And uh, I hope that you'll be interested in booking me for next year mm. or the year after. <coughs> thank you very, very much indeed. I've got a lot I could offer. So thank you very, very much. Good afternoon. Uh, that's me. I'm um, a semi-retired teacher of science. I say semi-retired because I still teach in secondary school from time to time. But I teach science and sometimes maths uh, or IT. When I first came to one of these presentation events, uh, the science course I offer was actually an afterthought. And the main course I offered was a course based <coughs> up upon a book I published. Now, I didn't get any takers for this, but I did for the science course, so I switched them around. And I mention this, but particularly I want to mention uh, the science course. Um, it is science. If you missed out on science uh, uh, when you were at school, or you did science a long time ago, and you may want to know more about the background of science, then I hope you will find it interesting. The two passions in my life or on the one side, politics, economics, morals, ethics, and argument about these things. And the other passion I have is science. And the idea behind the course is to provide a, a real understanding. And I hope it's accessible to people. I hope it's presented in a way that people can understand. It's to provide um, some scientific background to a lot of the controversies you might read about in the newspapers, uh, in the press generally, or on TV. There are ten different sessions. I can't obviously mention all of them, but the first one is about global warming, which I'm sure you are aware of. It's a big issue. And uh, at the end, we look at um, technology, uh, robots, um, information technology and how it affects our lives and how it might affect our lives in the future. And what I want to do today is to just to give uh, a sample of one or two of the things that we uh, talk about in the sessions, not in all of the sessions, but in some of them. For instance, global warming. I'm quite sure you've heard about um, carbon dioxide emissions and emissions from transport and heating your home and so on and how this is warming up the world. What a lot of people aren't aware of is the fact that uh, there are other gases that add to global warming. Gases that are more to do with our diet than how we move. For instance, uh, um, there are so many uh, um, beef and um, dairy cattle on the planet now and they produce a gas out of their backsides called methane gas. And the methane gas from the world's uh, um, herd of cows and cattle and sheep and pigs creates as much global warming as all of the transport in the world. All of it. 
And that's only one part of the methane. There's a lot of natural methane which bubbles up, which, uh, which may get worse. And that's uh, a picture, for instance, of some, a man in, uh, on a frozen lake in Canada. And there is so much methane bubbling out of the um, bed of that lake that he can uh, light a fire on the lake. That's, that's the same gas that you burn on your stove. So we look at global warming and we look at the science behind it because very often it's a bit more complex than perhaps uh, people realise. We look at a variety of different things. How can a baby have three parents? You may have seen a controversy some months ago now um, about uh, are we playing with God? Goodness me! How can a baby have three parents? And we look at exactly how it happens. Because you can have babies with three parents. And this is how it happens. I'll give you a little sample of how it happens. We all started life as a single cell, all of us here. We all started life as a single cell. And that uh, is uh, an egg cell inside your mum. That would have been an egg cell. And the main part, of course, is the nucleus. And that part's got a little bit from mum and a little bit from dad. Now, the dad hasn't contributed very much to that, really. Just some DNA, that's all. Uh, it's, uh, it's important, but 50% uh, of the DNA in that nucleus is from your dad. And 50% of it is from your mum. But all of the rest, all of the, all of the rest around it, all comes from your mum, from her egg cell. Now inside that egg cell there are little bits, important bits, called mitochondria. They're very important, but they all come from your mum. Your dad's sperm didn't bring any along with them. They all come from your mum. Now, what would happen if the mitochondria don't work? They don't work. They're in some way they're unhealthy. Well, what you do is you get uh, an egg cell from mum, you have it fertilised from dad and you take it out. You take it out of the lady's body. You take it out and you put it in a laboratory and you take out the fertilised nucleus. You take that out and you're left with the egg cell with the unhealthy mitochondria. So you take that out. Then another lady comes along and donates an egg. A different lady. She donates an egg, but her nucleus is taken out. So her nucleus is taken out. And then you put your healthy nucleus inside her, inside her cell. So there you have, there you end up there, you end up with a, a healthy cell. And most of the DNA, this bit here, has come from mum and dad. Actually, it's 49.95% from dad and 49.9% of the DNA from mum. And 0.1% of the DNA is from this donor. And that's how you have three parents. Now, whether you consider 0.1% to be a parent or not is up to you. But that's the science behind it. It really is three people making a healthy little baby. And 99.9% .9 of the DNA, of course, comes from mom and dad, normal mom and dad. And that will decide what the baby <coughs> looks like when it grows up, when it grows into a toddler, and it gets bigger, and so on. So we look at things like this. That's only one example. We look at things like this. Another thing we might look at is fracking. I'm sure you've heard of fracking. What is fracking? Well, the word fracking comes from the expression fracturing. Because deep underneath in the ground, rocks are fractured, deliberately broken, deliberately smashed up in order to extract the oil. That's a diagram similar to a diagram I might use. The reason why fracking, fracking was invented about 150 years ago, the reason why it's uh, useful now is because technology has moved on and the ability to drill down and then horizontally is a relatively new technology. Can you imagine drills? Not only that drill down, 
with drills that can turn and drill horizontally. And that's a very modern technology. And being able to do that is, um, uh, has added to the repertoire of um, geologists and uh, people who look for oil. Now, as you can see from the diagram on the bottom, the whole point about fracking is that you break up the rocks. You break up the rocks. And these little diagrams here show how the rocks might be broken, broken away from the main drilling point. Now, the reason why <coughs> fracking is controversial is because what goes on there, a thousand feet below the ground, can't really be monitored. You can't really see what's going on. And what the oil companies say is happening, and what actually might be happening, might be two different things. And this is the source of the controversy. Because one of the things that they do to get the oil out is they pump down chemicals. They pump down chemicals to loosen the oil, because there's little bits of oil in lots of rocks. It's to loosen the oil, to kind of shake it out, so they can pump it back up. Now, the chemicals they pump down, they won't tell you what they are, because it's a company secret. But you see, it's all right, because we pump them back up again. <coughs> and then we put it into tanks, and we take it away and dispose of it safely. But the problem is, a thousand feet below the ground, there's no way of telling how big these cracks are. You can't measure them. And they might say, well, the, the cracks that go away from the main oil drilling point might only be 20 or 25 or 30 feet but there's no way of telling because if you know anything about geology and rocks you know that there are always natural cracks and fissures in the rocks in any case and the danger is that these chemicals that they pump down would then go and spread and get into the aquifers in other words, the underground water reservoirs from which we get and from which we extract water. So, these are the kind of things we look at. What, what I try to do is, I've tried to pick six topics, sorry, ten topics, there could be more, but we, we, we stuck with ten, of things that are in the news, and we've talked about the science background behind it. I'm not going to tell you what your opinion should be, I have opinions of course, I'm not going to tell you what your opinion should be, but the hope is that your opinion is better informed. You have a better informed <coughs> opinion because you have some knowledge of uh, the science behind the discussion. Because you won't necessarily get it from uh, the Sun or the Express or the Daily Mail. You won't necessarily get the science that you want. And that's another one we look at. It might seem, it might seem uh, an obscure topic, but it's an interesting topic. Why, for instance, did we send um, a lander 300 million miles away to land on, um, on this, uh, this uh, comet? Uh, it didn't even, didn't, even, didn't even have a name at the time. I don't know if, it's, if it has, but it was called 67P. Um, but... but but uh, we landed something on it. We landed something on it. That's what it would look like if it sat over in Los Angeles, by the way. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, we, we, what, what, why, do, why do we land something on a, on a piece of rock six, 300 million miles away? What a feat of engineering. What a marvellous feat of science. But why do we do it? We do it because we're looking for them. <laughs> we're looking for life. Is there life out there? Is there life? And again, it's one of the things we look at. Um, I'm not going to say yes or no, but I'm going to say this is the science behind it. And this is, w this is why NASA and the European Space Agency keep sending things. The latest, uh, the latest venture, of course, was to Pluto. And even in the last couple of days, we've got some really brilliant close-up pictures of Pluto. And the first thing the scientists will do is they'll look at the pictures and they'll say, is there water there? Is there water there? Is there water on Mars? Is there water on the Moon? And they're asking that over and over again because they want to know, is there life on the Moon? Or was there life on the Moon? Or was there life on Mars? So again, we look at the science behind that. It's quite interesting.
And we also look at the, you know, the idea of unidentified flying objects. And what is the plausibility? What is the plausibility that we're actually being watched at the moment? Is it plausible? <coughs> so, anyway, anyway. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to do, I wanted to talk about, which seems to have disappeared. Perhaps it's, um, perhaps it's, uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's the wrong presentation. <laughs> was uh, how long have we lost? Six minutes. Okay. Was about was it was about the book? Was about the book. Now this uh, th this uh, I'm an atheist. I have to say it's fairly obvious from the book. The book is called Behind the Myths, and the book looks at the origins of the three main Ab uh, Abrahamic religions. That is to say, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's uh, it's a, a description from an atheist's point of view of how these religions arose um, 3,000 years ago and then 2,000 years ago and in the case of Islam about 13 or 1,400 years ago and there are no gods, no angels, no visions, no miracles, no fairies or anything of that kind. It looks at exactly what these things uh, looked at and when I researched for this book I read the work of uh, many, many eminent archaeologists, many eminent scholars. I'm not uh, such an eminent scholar myself, and looked at many things. And the book effectively challenges it challenges even the existence of many of the characters that are common in everyday life. Take the example of the Exodus. Everybody knows about the Exodus. And even people I know who are atheists talk about the Exodus and Moses as if it were actually historical fact. But is it historical fact? If you look at the Old Testament, and by the way, this is a shorter course, it's only perhaps six uh, sessions, and all you would need to bring along would be a Bible. But if you look at the Bible, you will see that uh, uh, tens of thousands of Israelites fled from Egypt spent 40 years in the Sinai before they eventually settled uh, in Canaan. And of course they conquered Canaan. And you all know the story about uh, Joshua fighting the Battle of Jericho and he blew his trumpet and the walls fell down. And you all know the story. They even write songs about it, don't they? <laughs> but the problem is that there isn't one shred of archaeological evidence behind that story. The Egyptians left us lots and lots and lots of inscriptions, lots of them, and papyri and all kinds of things, and uh, archaeologists have, and Egyptologists have looked at these for years. There's not one mention of Moses. There's not m one mention of tens of thousands of slaves, of Hebrew slaves escaping. Archaeologists have combed the Sinai Desert for 150 or 200 years looking for evidence of these wanderers for 40 years, mm. nothing, nada, nix, there's nothing there, there's no evidence. <coughs> what there is evidence of is when Canaan was conquered by the Hebrews according to the Old Testament, Canaan was actually an Egyptian province and we've actually got sitting in the British Museum Sitting in museums in France and elsewhere, because of course in the West all of the all of the artifacts from the Middle East were plundered in the 19th century, and we've got uh, actual tablets, cuneiform tablets of letters, written by governors, written by mayors to the pharaoh in Egypt. So at the time when supposedly Joshua was fighting the Battle of Jericho, it was actually quite a peaceful Egyptian province, and we've got all the evidence for that in the form of tablets. So in other words, there's no historical validity to the story. There's not one shred. And it's things like that that this book looks at. It's things like that. And we would look at uh, the evidence in the Bible, in the real Bible, for real events. Because it's, there are a lot of stories in it. There's a lot of myth in it. But there are evidence, like fossils, like little fossils of real events and real history in the past. And one of the things the book also does, it challenges the, 
the uh, historical veracity even of uh, the life of uh, Jesus. <coughs> the only historian of the day, a man called Josephus, Flavius Josephus, he took his name from the fact that uh, he, he, he did most of his writing in Rome and under the patronage of Romans, but he was himself Jewish. And he did actually come from Galilee. And he lived and he wrote around that time, um, around the, the first half of the first century of the modern era. And nowhere anywhere in the writings of Josephus is there a description of the events that we know of in the New Testament. So there are things like this. I look at archaeological evidence and link it to what's written in the Bible and so on. And finally, the same is true about Muhammad. There is a traditional story about the life of Muhammad, which I could go into, uh, which m most people um, from certainly a Judeo-Christian background, like most people here, don't know of. But there is a traditional story to the life of Muhammad. But the interesting thing about the traditional story of the life of Muhammad is that none of it was written at the time of his life. It was all written... 200 years afterwards, 150 to 200 years afterwards. It was all written, um, if you like, as a story to justify um, a religious movement. In other words, it was a myth. So what I'd like to do, and that's, uh, I would, I'm still offering that as a course, <coughs> a shorter course of six lessons, it looks, as the title of the book says, behind the myth. And it looks at the reality of how these religious movements developed, why they developed at the time they did, and also what, how, they, how they didn't develop. That is to say, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And that's it. My name is Fred Boot. I live at Tiptree, which is a couple of miles up the hill here only. So North East Essex is uh, an area that I travel around in quite a bit. I have taught for the WEA since 1984, so I can hardly claim to be a new tutor. <coughs> well, I'm scale in that case there. Um, I have travelled in the past quite extensively in Tiptree, in Essex, doing WEA across into Hertfordshire and I've been to Suffolk three times and I've I think been to something like 31 branches which means I expected to see a lot of people's faces here that I knew not very many, not very many of them never mind, perhaps I can entice some of you I have three courses um, to offer um, the first one is called um, what do I call it, let's say Wildlife and Conservation in East Anglia. Very much like Alex has started off there. Um, I did that way, way back then in the 80s. And soon after, I had one group, of, uh, one branch, that said, that was quite interesting, but um, can you come back and do more on the coastal side of things? Which meant going away and thinking about that. And then taking the course I'd done and splitting it into two, which was two halves, so I had to then build those two halves up into one inland and one on the coast. Which I find now is getting quite difficult to do because it keeps on being added to and gets too long for all the sessions there. So I have to spend time each year in pruning it and getting it back down to what I hope I can get through in an hour and a half. So the internal habitats, the woodlands, the grasslands, the heathlands, freshwater marshes and so on are all on one course, and the coast, and it's very interesting areas, on a second course. And two or three years ago, I thought, well, I've been doing those, I've been to lots of courses, branches for those. Perhaps I could do one that I really was interested in, which is human evolution. <coughs> so I spent, I think, three years probably <coughs> trying to produce it. But when it came to sort of offering it to the WEA, the lady in charge at the time wasn't too happy about my title and she spent quite a bit of time with me talking about what sort of title we should have and it finished up as um, the effect of climate change on human evolution 
And I found whenever I went to do that, that there were people sitting amongst the audience there who had only understood two words, the climate change. <laughs> and as far as I was concerned, it was human evolution, but affected by climate change and natural climate change. So I had, so nowadays I would go in and I would say, if it's climate change you want, and us affecting the climate, then perhaps you'd better get up and go, because it's not that at all. I am due to give that to Dick sitting here, Belstead, on January, and I'm calling it Human Evolution Affected by Natural Climate Change. <laughs> I'm hoping that might actually solve the problem. Probably not. <coughs> As I said, I live in Tiptree. I've been living there since 1965, when I returned from Nigeria, where I was teaching for three years. Um, Tiptree is very interesting in the sense that it's got a heathland right on its doorstep. It's only 60 acres, um, which, if you go back through the books and history, you'll find many centuries ago was something like 10,000 acres. So it's only a tiny little bit left now. It is an important bit, though, because it um, has got some things in it that are nowhere else in Essex. So as it's there, I thought it might be the best place to start and just do a little talk about um, there. So here we are, I'm hoping to show you a small section, a very, very small section of Tip Tree Heath. Um, probably go the right way first, get okay, used to this, this one. <coughs> Yes, tip for you. Sorry, I'm just getting used to what's going on there. Only 60 acres left. And it's right on the doorstep of a population of a village, as we call ourselves, which are now something like 11,000 people. Which is rather a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of people who want to use some green spaces to walk in. Um, and so we have a, quite a dense population um, coming to visit us. It means that looking after it becomes quite difficult particularly as we can go on. So maintain, maintaining a heathland has a problem because a heathland isn't really a natural habitat. It's something that was created back in the years gone by when we had people called commoners who were allowed to graze animals on it. And it was the grazing of the animals on a heath that kept it open as we call it, which if you like is treeless. Tipti also has a strange factor that during the last World War, it was in fact ploughed up. The, it's a common, a registered common, but it was ploughed up in the Deeper Victory campaign. So it means that when finally after the war was over, and it was not until 1955, that it was actually returned to a common status. So whatever's growing on there now has been growing only since 1955, which is rather unusual. Normally you've got no way of seeing what's going on. It means it's quite helpful for us like that. <coughs> Nature would try and turn that heathland into a woodland if you give it some time. 30 years, 40 years perhaps, and the, woodland, and the heathland would have gone and it would be woodland. So if you're going to look after a heathland, what you have to do is to consider the steps that go from an open heath through what's called scrub, which is bracken, brambles, um, hawthorn, backthorn, going into you can only just see it up at the top there. I'm not going to press any other buttons because I might go wrong again. <laughs> right up at the top of the picture there, you could just see some greenery all on the, the top there, which is small shrubs growing, which we're calling scrub. And behind that, lots of white sticks going up, which in fact are the tree trunks of birch. And beyond that birch, if I lifted the um, sight lines there to show the top of the birch, you would see some very low um, oaks beginning to grow. A little bit like the tortoise and the hare. The uh, scrub starts getting a move on and overgrows the heather. The uh, birch comes along and overgrows the scrub. And the oak ultimately come along and overgrow the birch to a large extent, and you get a birch wood scrub, an oak birch woodland. So, if you want to manage it, one of your problems is trying to control the scrub. We have a group of volunteers that we are using um, on the leaf here. This is one of them, and she's also one of the trustees. It's a lady, by the way, isn't it? And she's one of the trustees of the local um, charity, Friends of Tiptree Heath, 
is work with the Essex Wildlife Trust to manage it. So she is using what's called a brush cutter. And some of you might use something called a strimmer on your gardens. Well, this is the same principle, except the bit of string isn't there. It's a saw blade, a circular saw blade going around in there. So it's very useful for doing individual shrubs and so on like that. If it's going to get larger, you've got more to do, then you need a bigger machine. And we are very fortunate because we work with the Essex Wildlife Trust and we can call on them. This is one of their machines. It's called a forage harvester. It's a tractor drawn by which you would call an oversized lawnmower. You can adjust the cutting so you can have the cutting edge down so that the shrubs are, the shrubs are getting cut off, but the head <coughs> below is being untouched. Or you could lower it still right down to ground level and take out all the vegetation if you want. It all, all the cut material is going through a tube and squirting into that big bucket behind it. Just like a lawnmower, when you get to the point where it's full, you've got to stop and do something about emptying it, which means two, cho two choices to the, uh, what should I call them? And the people who are usually involved in making the rules here would say you should take all that vegetation that you just cut off the site completely to the green re re um, renewable site. Taking a tractor all the way along the roads to find that one and then come back and cut the next bit and then go back again would be impossible really. So what you have to do when you do this is to have a sacrificial site where as you're cutting, you're piling it all up. So at the end of the day you've got a nice clean, clear open area and one huge great big mound of what's this is called uh, gorse arisings. Um, gorse doesn't drop down very quickly so it'll be there for several years. So you're bringing in machinery um, to do that. The wildlife trust comes in and sorts us out in places like that. When we first started looking at the heath, which was in 1975, we um, just had a heathland to look after. But after a while, it was discovered that um, we were getting a large puddle in one particular area where we cleared a lot of the birch, which were all falling down. And that turned out to be a pond, or what a pond was many years ago. Now it's turned, because we dug it out, it took a long time to do that, several years. And this is actually just only a few years ago when it was suggested that it would be very useful if the pond was increased in size. The membership, the sentimental, the um, ownership and management of this particular heathland is rather strange. It's a registered common which makes everybody think, ah, oh, that means anyone can go there. So I should stop and say it's a privately owned registered common. <coughs> so the first problem coming in, the private owner happens to be Peter Wilkin, the um, lord of the manor, the owner of um, Wilkins and Jams. They're Wilkins and Sons Jams. He has been working with us in, since 1975 and is fully supportive of us to the extent that we now have a 30 year um, farm business tendency to manage it with the Essex Wildlife Trust. So two trusts looking after it. So we are land managers, he's still the owner. And because it's a site of special scientific interest, it means that that was Natural England who had known gave us that. And it means they have a say in how it's managed. A very serious um, say. If we don't do what we're told, we could lose that title, that status. And with that, we'd go to the um, security, perhaps, of the heath saying a heath. So it could turn into a, a nature reserve. So here we are. But what I'm saying here is we, it was, the pond was expected. It, intended to be extended and we had to bring in machinery to do it. Machinery cost money of course, labour and machinery there. So the friends of Tipka Heath spent quite a bit of their time not only working on the heat, but also raising money to be able to buy things like that when they need to. So we've got this dedicated um, volunteers there. Like a lot of the organisations that are managing places like this, you get to the point where you're saying all these machinery and all these people are very good but very expensive. Um, how was it kept clear in the, in the early days? The answer is grazing. So it's a case of bringing in grazing animals. The first thing is to get permission to do that because you usually have to fence to protect the animals. 
Chipsley Heath has got a main B road, a very fast B road between Chipsley and Malden, running right along beside the heath. So we need to have fencing in order to protect the animals from getting out on the road and being killed and causing problems. It takes about two years to get fencing sorted out and um, permission from the government to do that. Uh, we have done that and we brought in, then we brought in cattle. Big decision how you're going to have cows, goats, ponies, <coughs> cattle. There's all sorts of things you could do. We chose Texas and we had four of them brought in. It's turned into five within a couple of days or so. <laughs> <laughs> when we contacted the, um, the, the man who, owned, who, owned them, who was providing them for us, only them to us, he said, oh, I don't even expect it for a few weeks yet. <laughs> It actually, you can just see the calf up in the corner there. Um, we, one of the things we had to do as well as putting fencing in was to put a corral arrangement in because the animals come to us and go away from us. And they're not there all the time. And they're there because we want them to eat all that nasty scrub that's growing there. The bush, all the bracken and the brambles and the gorse and all the rest of it. And they do, but they also need grass in order to be able to digest it all. And if the grass supply starts getting low, the animals were cycling into trouble and then they have to be taken away and given time for the grass to grow again. So the limit, the time for growing is limited. That means that after a while you start saying, well, how about trying eight more ponies then? If you go and ask people who've got, how many minutes have I got left? Five? No, you've lost some somewhere. <laughs> but I always do that. So uh, we've got eight more ponies now and that means I should move on. Dedicated people working on their work parties there. Um, they also do guided walks. Morning, Wednesday morning health walks are tremendous. And we do surveys, lots of surveys of lots of different things. Um, this one's a butterfly one earlier this year. The warden with the lady crushing around in the foreground there with a butterfly net. <laughs> well, so I've got three things. I've got to move on quickly. The coastal um, one. Alex was talking about the Tupper Coast there. This is Ben Acre Broad, or the exit Ben I'm looking south. If the clouds would let me, you'd see South Old Pier down there. An interesting coast. It's got um, longshore drift bringing shingle in the, in the sea all the way along, and that shingle gets dropped across stream entrances, blocking them off and turning them into dam streams, which makes a freshwater lake. Again, Alex was talking about Ben Acre Broad there. It was a freshwater lake with reeds in it and lots of things like chickens, marsh harriers, and um, <coughs> bearded chips in them. The sea, of course, is moving that shingle along. It can choose where it puts it down and creates shingle ridges and where it takes it away. And it does times, several times now in the last few years, it's actually broken the breach. Here you can see water trickling out. That's not the problem, it's when the tide churn, tide changes and the water comes in, then the seawater comes through and into the reed beds and will of course kill them in the end because they're fresh water reeds. So there's lots and lots of things going on with the coast. Um, unfortunately I don't talk as fast as Alex. <laughs> or get through as much as he does for the sound of it there. Uh, I've got five, ten, ten weeks in which to do these and deal with the various aspects that are going on in there. Ben Acre Board looking there. This is an aerial picture. Um, it's showing over here. This is the creek to off to the left of your, on the right of your, to the right of yours, you've got a creek going down to Mersley, Salcock Creek. And the creek comes up around here. I'll see if I can use it. The reek creek comes up around here and goes to Salcock Village in this direction here. When the tide comes in, then the tide flows up here into the creek and then flushes back out again. Um, the sea wall goes round like that <coughs> and out there. This is Abbott's Hall, the headquarters of the Essex Wildlife Trust, and they bought that farm um, for the purpose of a putting somewhere bigger for their staff, which was growing, but also so they could get into the coastal alignment, um, which is just another name Alex was using the term managed retreat. Um, it was actually 
drop that return was because it was causing problems with managing the retreat in particular there. They got the coastal alignment, which really isn't any better. So there we are. So we got coastal alignment. What it means is in this case here, seawall off stage here had a breach 25 metres across, which is like something from me to the wall there. Um, one there, one there, another one there, another one up the creek there, and then a big one, which you can see here across there. They are deliberate holes made in the sea wall. So when the tide comes flooding up here, the sort of as it does, and goes back again, it also comes into all of these breaches and floods across these fields. The whole idea is, is that going to turn those fields from being arable fields into salt marsh? And if it is, that salt marsh might be a new defence for us against flooding. It also, from a conservation point of view, will create a very um, useful salt marsh which is disappearing elsewhere in our country. So it's an experiment, along with several other experiments that are going on, four of them in the um, backwater estuary. And uh, it takes time to find out whether it's successful or not. So this was done in 2000, 2002. Yes, 2002 was the first time it was coming in, the sea was coming in there. So we're now 12, 13, 14 years on from there. And we're still seeing, now we're seeing um, salt marsh growing along here. It's going to be quite a while. The um, contours were actually sorted out by GLS for, for us. Um, because we thought four metres would be reached by time quite quickly, or five metres. Um, we not got there, so I think the um, suggestions were perhaps a little... Well, I've done it again. So you're all right. I'm finished. Yeah. I'm out of time. So I won't bother with the other course, which is the newer one. Which, um, I'm going to be talking to Dick and his people at Pels there, starting on the... Ooh. First Monday in Jan. First Monday in January. Thanks for